All right, whip. You were telling me, you you were giving me this 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 imagination, this 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 idea of whip or the potential coach in terms of how you would you would run things. I know that you still want mm-hmm. to play and you want to 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 slam some kids on the rift, but you were giving me already a lot of inspiration about how thing how you would be running things. Could could you could you mm-hmm. could you tell me this 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 again? Yeah, um, basically, um, like after having done some coaching work, I, I worked with Academy a little bit. Um, I realized that like the the structure I would use to coach would be very different from what is currently accepted as like the main like the how do you even say this like uh, the accepted I don't know it's like the status quo I guess yeah mm. uh, that's that's a good way to describe it like I, I would use a very different way to coach than the current accepted status quo which is like. You know, you book scrims four times or five times a week, like or maybe three times a week in LEC, whatever it is. Um, you do two blocks or one big block of five hours, and then, you know, you play four days a week. Then, you know, you clock in from 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. or whatever it is, and then you clock out, and then, you know, like that's kind of it, right? And then, obviously, as a coach, you would, you know, after clocking out, you'd watch VODs, and then you'd bring stuff to the team that you want the team to do, blah, 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 right? I would do have a very, I would have the, like, this, the, I would want to do the same thing. Uh, however, my approach would be very different in the sense that, like, I don't think scrims are as useful as people make them out to be, uh, and I don't think people do a good job of making scrims useful because uh, individually people are not capable of executing certain ideas. Um, and I think that, like, staff, like coaching staff and teams, like, in you know, staff in, within teams, they usually give up on those things, right? So if they're like, well, we want to play, you know, a topside game doing X, Y, or Z. Um, they will try it in scrims, right? And then if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, they're just like, well, I guess it's just not for our team. Mm. And, um, my structure would be rather than book scrims, if it is something that we are trying to learn is to teach the players individually how to do it one by one, right? So I would sit next to them in solo queue and, and I would have them practice, um, the, the lines that I want them to be able to run in the scrim environment and that scrims are specifically for improving as a team and that means that like i don't like i don't give a shit if my if my jungler can 1v9 a game or my top laner or my a mid or whatever like this is not why we, we meet up to scrim we don't scrim so that we can flex our mechanics in, in 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 a in a coordinated setting like i don't care about that i really care that the people that i'm working with uh players especially understand what is their responsibility within a league game when we are playing together that is it. Nothing more, nothing less. I, I want them. To, I want it to be super clear for everyone involved what their responsibility is. And when it comes to strategy, you know, for example, the example I gave you is like a bot-centric team suddenly wants to play top side. We've all been there. We, yes, like yes. every team's tried it. And then it's like, well, you know what? Maybe we should just keep flying through bot. Mm. Um, rather than attack it that way of like, yeah, let's just show up and pick pick jacks and make it a top side game. Is really sit next to our top laner. Uh, and ideally include the jungler as well in the reviews of that and, and really talk about, you know, what are the good timings? How can we recreate this? And, you know, dig in matchup specific stuff where, uh, you know, this is when we, we attack this matchup. This is when we don't. Like, this is when we do X, Y, Z. And, and really learn that from the ground up on an individual level because, uh, you know, it's an example um, I use, um, may have gotten it from Mephisto, may have got, like, I don't remember where I got it from, uh, if I thought of it myself or for someone else. But, an orchestra doesn't practice by just playing the music. You don't play a score of Beethoven and then, like, you know, 20 people don't start playing the score and then the, the conductor is just listening to it and be like, okay, yeah, let me just fix this, this, and this, you know? Yes, yes. It's 20 people or 30 people or however many are in the orchestra all playing, all practicing the music individually in their own rooms, wherever they practice, and then they meet up to make the symphony. Yes, yes. And I think that in League of Legends, it's the opposite. People sc- come together to scrim. And they're supposed, like, and then a the coach is supposed to be able to, from, from the cacophony, make a symphony. And it's just, it doesn't work. You know, like, it, it just doesn't work. I don't think it works. I don't think as a coach you can have any real influence coaching that way. Uh, so for me personally, I, I think that is a big issue in, 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 in esports. Um, obviously, this is the reason why the best players get paid a lot. Because they are, they have the capability to play the score individually. You know, they they play the music individually very well. They know what their responsibility is. They know what they have to do. You know, 
individually from their perspective. Uh, however, I don't think that it's that hard to teach not tier one players how to play like a tier one player. Uh, I, I really think the difference between a, uh, an amateur player or an academy player or an ERL player and, you know, a top level LEC player, it isn't in how they pilot the champion, right? And I don't believe that if you make, uh, I don't know, I don't know who's an up and coming top laner in ERL. Do you have any ideas? Like any names? Ragnar could be one. Ragnar, right? Like if you look at me and Ragnar, would you say that I'm a better player? Probably, right? But is that because if I play Renekton and Aatrox, that the guy can't lane against me for ten minutes? No. I'm sure this guy can play mm-hmm. Renekton and Aatrox against me for ten minutes, fifteen minutes, even twenty, even, and do absolutely fine. I think he could do it tomorrow. Mm. The issue lies in where he has a worse understanding of me of what my responsibility is in the game and what his responsibility is in the game. And he will, he will put himself in positions where he does too much or too little. And he will take responsibility that he shouldn't be taking, but it really is someone else's. Mm. And because he's doing something that someone else should be doing for him, that obviously is going to make his performance worse, right? Like, look at it from a, uh, you know, from a normal job perspective, right? If it's not your responsibility to do something, you shouldn't have to do it. Because if you do, that's going to affect your performance as a whole, right? Yes, yes. And that's, that's logical, right? It's the same in sports, right? If the guy, you have a guy that's dedicated to rebounding the ball in basketball, then it's that guy's job to rebound and no more, no less, right? Yes, yes. If he does more, fantastic. If he has the opportunity to do more, he will take that. But he will not force those opportunities. And that's the thing where a lot of people like, misunderstand like, why suddenly a, a really strong player can have a really bad performance. It is because they are forcing opportunities that aren't presenting themselves because they are uh, taking too much responsibility upon themselves to dictate the pace of the game. That's my opinion, at least. Hmm. No, I'm, so, yeah. I'm... I've definitely seen plenty of that, right? When you see a a player in the context of maybe facing up against teams that are better or in a a team environment that didn't necessarily, maybe they don't believe in their odds to win and then suddenly a team looks a lot worse because they're trying to squeeze things that are not squeezable. Uh, There's definitely an inflection of that. Uh, But I guess that happens on on each level and each layer, uh, even when it's not a question of playing against uh, the best of the best. I imagine mm-hmm. this happens in the context of every facet of the game. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Play more than 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships in dynamic combined arms PvP battles. Immerse yourself in any combat vehicle from all the way back to the 1920s to the present day. Every vehicle is incredibly detailed and modeled down to their individual components, offering a highly immersive combat experience. An in-depth customization system for all vehicles allows you to turn your vehicle into one that will be feared by all and many more. Tactical, fast pace and action-packed, or more realistic, War Thunder offers it all. Whichever experience you are looking for, you will find it here. Me. I just like to blow shit up. Play free now on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5 or the previous console generation. Click the link below now to start with a boost. I um, yep. I thought it was... I, I, I think this, this conversation is so interesting because I, I've, I've thought a lot about, you know, this whole conversation with, with East against the West and I feel like everything is always so surface level in terms of what it is. It's like, oh... Uh, the the West doesn't practice hard enough or, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. players don't practice hard enough, they don't put enough hours, they don't care. I think a lot of these things are very surface level and I feel like strictly from a point of view of what resources are, uh, usually when, like, when 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 a place has a lot of players with high pedigree and greatness, usually greatness begets greatness. It's like, even, even locally here in Europe, you can think of like Froggen was was the guy that a lot of Danish players looked up to and they wanted to be him. There was a lot of Danish middleners that came after Froggen. Same thing with Jankos and Polish junglers. 
these might be like anecdotal, uh, you know, examples, but in the context of having players to look up to, that's a very powerful force in like creating a greater line of players, especially when you get to compete against them. Then of course, it's the server, it's the player base, it's the resources, the money around it, it's the culture around it, all these things. But there's, there's a lot of circumstances outside of esports where there's outliers, where maybe the resources aren't the best and the amount of people that are involved in it is very limited, but they've found methods and practice methods and ideas that make them break through the norm. Like a very good example, I don't know how much you see you've watched, but there's like the Republic of Dagestan has like 3 million people and all of the Dagestani fighters that are fighting from from Dagestan and they're fighting in the UFC, they are smoking mm -hmm. everybody. They're smoking, smoking everybody. And <laughs> it's, 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 it's 3 million people, but whenever there is a Dagestani fighter, they have this iconic beard, like Khabib Nurmagomedov is like the guy who it was mm -hmm. uh, know, beat, beat uh, Conor McGregor and so forth. He retired undefeated. But all of the fighters that are coming out of there are just smoking everybody. Then they don't have the resources. Relatively, they live very poor there, but very humble and the, the very humble lifestyle. And uh, the, the conditions in terms of how many people are involved and so forth. Of course, wrestling is a very, very big deal in Dagestan, but it's just in their practice methods. It's like they... I, I, I know this very, very surface level, but what they did is they, they, they found a way to like train maybe 12 hours a day, but they do it very playfully. They never do it at maximum intensity. And then as long as they get, got the repetition, like repetitions in, they really mastered technique on a whole nother mm -hmm. level because they kept it playful. They always kept it playful with one another. It wasn't, it wasn't ever like this maximum intensity as you see in a lot of like movies and in gyms where you have to like break your bones and you have to like really tear yourself apart. They do it really, really playfully. And through that, they got all of the, the repetitions in and the technique in, and there is a camaraderie and a culture uh, within how they practice that is really, really amazing to watch. I only know this uh, as a surface level, but it's still a very good example of how an outlier can be so powerful, even though the odds are stacked against them. And in regards to how, how you mentioned things, and a big feeling of what I've gotten from G2 as well, which is talking, talking from Ramar in terms of how they approach the practice process. I think that's so, so important because I remember like back in, back in season five, when I worked with Horo, he just came from SKT, he was in SKT season four. And he told me, oh, this is how they are doing things. They scrim and then they review. It's like the basic structure that we know today. It's like they told me, it's like, wow, they do this. Okay, super cool. Let's apply it and let's do it. And inherently, it's like we, we, in order to beat the odds, you need to find ways to become an outlier. I feel like what, what you're touching on could be maybe that, you know? Because I think reinnovating the practice process is something that is so fundamental to everything that needs to be done. I wanted to ask you, especially now with the format of, 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 of Europe, it's like I think the format really punished the old way of doing things, where a lot of the veteran players, they like to start slow and then they, you know, ramp up in a season. You know, we've, mm -hmm. I, I, we've had many times where G2 and Fnatic, they start off the first week, they go a little 0, 3, 1, 2, and they drop to maybe 1, 5, and then they pick up again, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. now the format is very, very punishing and the preseason preparation is also important. What do you believe are things that can be worked on as an individual level, at an individual level and also a group level when it comes to, let's say, the, the three months ahead of a season starting? Mm. It's always hard because um, like before a season starts, it's, uh, what's really important is to know what came before it. Mm. Um, why is this relevant? Is because I think spring split or winter split in this case um, mm. for LEC is it comes after Worlds, right? And the people that went to Worlds had like a really intense schedule, and the reward is adequate to that schedule. The thing about League is there's going to be people that are going to be practicing that same schedule, but for the regular split and winter split, right? They, they'll, they'll be playing 14 hours a day or, you know, 
maybe not necessarily playing 14 hours a day, but working 14, 15 hours a day, right? Like, I, I think 16 hours a day is something that, like, uh, happens more rarely. Uh, but again, it could be, right? Like, basically, people working very hard for a smaller reward, right? That's why it's important to recognize what happens before, because veteran players, they, you know, they show up, they play their, you know, they play their Worlds tournament, and, and they get rewarded big time for playing at Worlds, right? Playing at yeah. Worlds is a prestige in the current day and age, right? Like, it's a big deal being a Worlds player. And, like, I didn't even realize how big of a deal it was until, like, I really, you know, looked at it in perspective and also, like, understanding and realizing the difference. Like, the difference between, like, how people behave in a game where a Worlds is happening and they know that I'm a Worlds participant in solo queue, right? In China, Korea, Europe, it doesn't matter, right? Like, that respect that you get for being a Worlds player, right, it's very different from being a content creator. Um, like, when I compared the way that content creators, um, like, how people behave around content creators in the, the Korean solo queue, you know, there's a whole boot camp that everyone are yes, doing, yes. right? And comparing that to a world's player, that's a huge deal. Now, why is this important? Is because motivation is a large part of, of, of performance, in my opinion, right? Mm. In order to be the best, uh, you need to put in the hours. And if you do not have something driving you to put in the hours, well, it's hard to get there, right? Mm. Um, and I think that um, for any returning veteran, one has to find a way to, you know, get those hours in. Like, how, how can I motivate myself to play that much? Because I think it's something that I struggled with as well, uh, especially later on in my career. Because I remember at the start of my career, um, my scrim game, my one scrim game I got every single day in 2018, <laughs> uh, that was an LEC game for me, you know? Like, that, that was, like, do or die for me, you know? It was life or death. And now, I've caught myself um, last year, the year before that, where it's like I would like I would feed in a scrim and I wouldn't even care, you know. It's like yeah, yeah. not that I wouldn't care, but I, I, it wouldn't break me, you know. Like it would not break me in like a terrible sense, but like it wouldn't like really bother me. That 2018 year, like it genuinely bought. Like I lost that scrim game and I felt awful, you know. Like if I had a bad scrim game, I was like, wow, I wasted everyone's time, you know. Like I feel really bad about it. Mm. I think going back to a world where we separate the value of scrims compared to, uh, you know, like the, the practice regime that you do, I think that is uh, pivotal to increasing performance. Um, like preseason, like valuing those preseason scrims and really putting in the hours, not because like you're getting paid in the sense, like paid in satisfaction by, for example, playing at Worlds but rather uh, entering a situation where just putting in the hours is good enough. Mm. It, it, it feels... Oh. Oh, you, need, you need a break? Yeah, one moment, one moment. All one right, moment. all right. No worries at all. No worries. No, I just... Lana forgot that I was talking to you today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I wanted to bring up... I, I feel like there's... It's like... I, I can understand where... You know... The, the, the separation of when things are starting, there's a sense of pride and there's a sense of proving yourself that comes with every scrim game, especially it's like the first first time you play in the LEC, you scrim against uh, the other LEC teams, you're shooting yourself off, and then there's an essence of, uh, it becomes mundane because it is just a part of the day to day. And I think it also bleeds, I, I, like I think losing that sense of pride in your own performance, like the fact that, your what you express in the game is a reflection of what your best is sometimes people like to wrap it in excuses it's like oh i slept tired i cared a little bit less whatever you want to wrap it in i feel like it is always a reflection of your best right so like i i mm -hmm. said for the majority of like that uh our year together where i say yo let's, let, let, let's try to do our best coming into this game right and and the more and more I thought about it is that I feel like whatever someone puts in is a reflection of, of, of their best. It's just wrapped in different paper. Sometimes it's wrapped in shit. Sometimes it's wrapped in something else. It's like whatever you tell yourself. And I think in, in scrims, there is that loss of, of, of pride and loss of that uh, idea of wanting to perform. But I think it's two-sided because I think it also bleeds into what you mentioned before. How many scrim games have you sat through and the game is over? 
It's like you, you play, you lane, maybe you, you, you're laning against uh, Wunder, you're laying for 10 minutes and then bot lane did an all-in level one that broke the whole game and then uh, that game was just kind of, you just went through the motion because whatever your output was there was not super, super relevant. But initially, a lot of the things that could be prepared before you are in that situation where you needed to perform and you are lending everyone's time that is involved, let's say there's 20 people involved in a scrim block, right? I'm being mm -hmm. maybe a little bit too extreme, but if you count coaches and everyone involved, right, there's about mm -hmm. 20 people, right? Uh, yeah, sure. th there's there's so much work that could be done outside of scrims in preparation for scrims because scrims should be a measurement of performance and a focus of this is where everyone's time is focused on the same thing. So I think it really, really bleeds into to, to both things because I think it's there needs to be an essence of pride, but I can also understand that with time, you know, some scrims don't feel as effective because of the lack of that level of preparation, right? Mm -hmm. So I can I, I can definitely definitely see that. There's 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 so much that can be done outside of scrims. I think it even ble bleeds into uh, something as simple as as champion understanding, right? I I feel like mm -hmm. this was something that was always so so easy with you, where you brought a champion to the table it was very easy to have a conversation with you about why you wanted to play something. And that why is sometimes lacking with players. You know, even in the group that we were yeah. working with, right? It's like they wanted to play something because someone else plays something. But yeah. the, the why needs to come with a reason. And then all of a sudden, there's kind of an idea that, that is built through that. And in the end, we had this identity where we played through bottom side and you were very flexible and you, you basically... We, we, we saw the team as, as building blocks and you try to gel yourself in accordance with that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that worked super, super well because you had a very strong idea of what needed to be done while the other players were kind of, you know, more rigid in, in, in their approach to the game. It's like Adam mm -hmm. was a very specific player. Niski was a very specific player in our bot lane. You know, they, they always wanted to, they were armored to the teeth. They wanted to <laughs> mm -hmm. pressure, right? And mm -hmm. I think you were very, very good at always analyzing why. Because I think always that conversation in terms of preparation, how many times, I don't know if, if in your experience you've worked with players where they say, oh, I don't want to play this champion anymore. This champion is useless. And it's like, what happened? Mm -hmm. We practiced for two weeks and now this champion is useless. Well, what happened? Yeah, yeah. Well, how did we jump? It's like, oh, I played this solo queue. I was 6-0. I couldn't carry. Enemy jungle was this champ. I was like, oh, yeah. shit. Well, what, what happened here? What, what was the jump? Uh, I feel yeah. like even that conversation is like, oh, LPL is playing this champion. I feel like the longest mm -hmm. time I watch Western teams, they play Lushanami and they don't do anything with Lushanami because they, they yeah, lean yeah. well. And then it's like, how do they convert Lushanami? It's not the same. And uh, I, th I think that layer of, of preparation can also be done out of side of screens because the, the footage is there. The volume is there. If you want to take ideas from something, you just have to take everything that encompasses it. Mm -hmm. I, I I remember it's like you you've always played very unique champions. Like you've yeah. it's like you've you've played what I, like when I try to think of Bipo champs, my mind explodes. I think Aatrox, Singe, I think Or and Sion, they're pretty standard. I remember your Zach, I remember your Victor, I remember your Volibear, I remember Shen, mm -hmm. I remember Ergot, I remember GP. It's like you always you 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 understood the question why super well. Yeah, I think the main, like, I've talked about this on my stream before, but the main reason why I, like, added champions to my pool was always, um, I always try to fit it in the draft. Like, that's where it, it's always a matter of why did I, like, what do I need, what does my team need, and why am I, like, who, who can fit the bill, right? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, in a lot of the drafts uh, in, in competitive league, like damage mix is a big thing, right? You don't want to stack four AD champions or stack five AD, a, AP champions and then like, you know, enemy team stacks them hard, becomes very efficient, blah, blah, blah. And I know it's like a very simple concept, but it does apply to competitive league still. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time AP control mages or AP mids are a very regular thing, right? So in the context of the teams I've played on, um, I'm a big believer in blinding your top laner. Um, I always have been. Uh, I've always, I've always believed that if you can blind pick top lane, um, that makes the most sense. Now, why does that make the most sense? Well, everyone always complains about top lane being the weakest and least impactful role. So surely, in terms of draft, it should also gain the least resources, right? That would make sense, right? Because it's the least impactful role. So uh, as a result, what I would do uh, most of the time when I was playing is um, I would blind pick my champion. I would blind pick Gangplank. 
uh, Orn, Aatrox, and these are my most successful years, uh, is when I prioritized blinding these champions. I think when I stopped blinding these champions, my performance also uh, was hurt in terms of like win rate, right? Like So maybe individually I performed better because I had a better matchup or easier to navigate matchup. However, truly when it comes down to, you know, the what matters, which is winning, because let us not kid ourselves, a professional player gets hired to win games on stage. Yes, yes. Uh, I just want to clarify that a lot of people are like, the way how matters? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Enemy Nexus explodes, job's done, right? And there should be no other discussion around that. It should be Enemy Nexus explodes, good enough. Mm. Um, that said, um, that is my biggest success. And then suddenly, when people started banning those champions because they realized, like, oh, this guy just blinds these champs and performs rather well. Um, so we're going to attack this person in the draft, right? So they're going to remove Aatrox from the draft, removing Gangplank first three, removing Orn. Now, obviously, I've been very fortunate to play with very, very strong players uh, over the over the course of my career. So as a result, if you ban my champions, you probably lost to, you know, Caps playing this or Reckless playing that or, mm. you know, whatever. Um, that happened sometimes. And that's where I was like, okay, well, instead of Aatrox, I'm going to have to blind pick something else. Right, I, I need a physical damage champion that slots in here, uh, and that's where Set, Urgot, Volibear suddenly start showing up because mm. that's why I'm picking them, because they're fulfilling the same spot in the draft. And even though they're banning my champions, it doesn't affect my teammates. My teammates do not have to compensate, and suddenly I have to last pick, or um, suddenly I have to do something that I not normally wouldn't. Now, obviously. Uh, there are moments where I would say, like, well, I can't really blind pick anything if they're going to ban two, or I would need a ban to match their ban so I can blind pick still. Uh, but the point still stands that um, I never wanted to play a champion because I thought it looked cool or someone else did it. I always wanted to play champions because within the structure of the draft that we set up, which is the main one you're going to practice, right? Because I, I think for the most part, draft structure is something that doesn't really change patch to patch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very rare that it does, but it's 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 like to this day, draft structure in league is ban OP champs on like basically red side tries to two for one, mm -hmm. <laughs> and blue side bans to make sure that doesn't happen, and then you just pick whatever one you think is better, right? Because there's usually two or three OP champions. It's very rare that it's just one. Um, you know, usually honestly, I'd say there's like an average of four OP champions. Uh, I think that's fair, maybe three or four, uh, and then blue side would ban one, and then uh, red would. Um, ban another, uh, well, then red would leave open another, and then you would trade OP for OP plus one, right? Yes, yes. And then the draft just plays out. That's the rest of the draft. Mm. Um, that structure hasn't changed, and it won't change. So when I was playing, um, like a big, big reason why I would um, perform really well is because I, I adhered to that structure, and I kept it uh, very honest. So I made sure that whenever we like entered this type of draft meetings that I didn't like I wasn't hard to read, you know? It's like, look, this is what I'm gonna blind. If they ban it, this is what I'm gonna blind. Mm. End of story. And it's very easy for someone to understand why I'm playing a champion, because I'm not talking about like, oh yeah, set does XYZ in this draft and this champion does blah blah blah. This is why I'm playing these champions. No, no, that have nothing to do with it. Like what my champion can do in the game is secondary. The main reason why I'm prioritizing and playing this champion is because I want our draft to be as powerful as possible and to be as close to what we've practiced as possible. And playing those unique champions allow me to keep that structure so that we can constantly come back to comfort, right? Like, what was our practice? You know, what did we practice? Like, because I think, obviously, if, if you've played the draft for, for, for three weeks, uh, pretty much straight, you know, like always the same structure, that um, it is comfortable to know what is going to happen. Uh, there's less stress yes, before yes. you go into the game because you know what to expect. It's also a very and easy, even though, easy path. Ahead, of, yeah. it's, it's a very easy path of improvement because you, it's, it's very easy to measure your own success through the role mm -hmm. that has been defined to you, right? It's like if, yeah. if if you know your role is to make sure that the try to make the jungle come top and make him eat shit and waste his time and you know that there is a there's a measurement of success there that can become a lot more apparent than a simple stat line. It's like oh I need to win lane and I need to get CS numbers and that's like the only measurement of success. 
um, it's it becomes so much easier to look for points of improvement if you know what your your role is how, how, and how mm-hmm. what you've defined defined yourself in. I, I interrupted you. What 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 did you want to say, Whip? Uh, honestly, I, I I was listening to your point, and I think it was uh, I think it was pretty much what I was trying to say. Okay, it's, okay. It's, it's like that's what I was talking about in terms of responsibility. Mm. You know, like not having to do more or less. Just this is what this is what's enough. And if I can do more, I will try to. However, it is not necessary. I will not f- look for those opportunities. I will let them come to myself. You know, like I will let them come when, when they are given, right? Uh, and what I wanted to mention is like uh, a big reason why I was successful playing some off meta picks. Though again, like if you actually look at my win rate, which is like I said, that is ultimately what defines performance in League of Legends uh, as a professional, right? Or any professional, it is winning or losing, right? Um, I always won the most playing those blind picks, like Aatrox, Gangplank, and Orn. Mm. They're my most successful champions. Like, I win on those champions. Uh, on average, I win two out of three games, which is pretty good, I think. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's pretty solid. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, clarify that. Um, the, the next step, after I defined why I wanted to play it, was what I can do when I play it. And I think a lot of people have that backwards. It's like, oh, if I play this champ, I can 1v9 if I do this, this, or this, right? Mm. But it's like, you have no control over that, right? Like, that's very hard to control. Especially in a coordinated setting uh, with a team, right? I would first find a reason to play it, and then I would find a solution on how to optimize playing it. And I think that structure, that process, is something that a lot of players are missing. Um, and that's why, like, you don't see any pro teams really innovating anymore because the players can't like, reason why you would play those champions. Um, and even though they would want to play more off-meta picks, um, their team just, you know, kind of doesn't allow them because it doesn't like they don't make sense, right? Yeah, you can one v nine playing uh, set, but you could also just pick Renekton, right? You could just pick Renekton, and then if you have a good game, you can one v nine too. Mm. Why do we have to go out of our way to pick set, right? Yes, yes. And I think that's a totally fair assessment. Uh, that's why I understand when coaches are like... Uh, that's why I always understand when coaches are like, yeah, I don't know about this. Mm. And obviously I'm not perfect. Uh, I've had many moments. Like, I remember this. there was this one in last year's summer where I, Renekton got buffed and I was playing him in solo queue and I was running every game and then I would play him in scrims. And I'm like, I got angry at my staff for picking me a champion that I wanted them to pick me. <laughs> I was like, why the fuck did we pick Renekton? This champ's so fucking useless. When I'd been constantly, like, talking about Renekton for weeks and like, dude, I think this champ with Stridebreaker and Blade is quite good, you know? Like, instead of going Gold Ring or Blizzard, I think if you go Stridebreaker Blade, I think you can actually flash W and one-shot people. And Renekton, historically, when he could build a, a build that could one-shot people with W, or at least, like, really threaten, like, put him really low. Mm-hmm. Uh, always very strong, right? Um... And then I picked it, and I performed poorly, and then I got <laughs> mad at my staff. <laughs> um, I was like, why, do, why, why the fuck did we pick this Renekton champion? That, like, what is this about, you know? And then, I, to, like, this was the story that uh, Giotto kept telling me, like, throughout the split, like, remom- like humble me and remind me, and, and, and I appreciated that. I really appreciated that. Um, I really appreciate when a staff can humble their players in a way that is, like, m- mutual understanding, you know? Because I think humility is... Um, it is where one, I think humility is the best way to appreciate the process. Mm. Could, 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 right? you, could you elaborate? I think humility is accepting, like for me at least, this, this is my personal way of viewing humility, is like, it is accepting that you are trying your best. Okay. And that you are focused on the process, not the result. Like, okay. when I think of humility, it's like, for example, when I'm playing against uh, a one-trick player, right? And I'm, like, super focused on winning, and I have to win, I have to win, I have to win. And I just somewhat disrespect that person's ability uh, to play the champion that, they're, like, that they master, right? It's like... Mm. Most of my success working with one-tricks has been, like, accepting that they are better than me when it comes to the situations on that champion. And and I really focus not on the fact that I'm better or worse than them, but I really focus on the process of learning from them. Hmm. That's why, like, for me, humility is a really important part. Like, down the line, I think my humility in practice is what made me very successful in the sense that, like, I never looked at the situation with the notion of, I'm this good, 
Well, not never. <laughs> That's kind of the issue. <laughs> so, I try, like, when I was up and coming as a rookie, I never looked at a situation with the sense of, like, I'm this high LP. My, like, past achievements never influenced what I thought about the game mm. or the situations that I was in um, back then. I think in recent years I've had that happen. I've caught myself feeling that way and thinking that way. Mm. Uh, and I hate that. You know, I really think it, it, it is just harmful. That's what I mean with, like, humility is the best way. Like, it's, it is, like, uh, the way to respect practice, you know? No, for sure. The best way to respect practice. It, it, is, a, it is not about the result. It is about understanding and appreciating the process that one is only as good as how hard they try to practice and how hard they try to understand what their responsibility is in the game. And they accept uh, the accountability for, for, you know, they take accountability for what they can and cannot do, basically. That is what I think humility is about, um, at least in a practice sense for when I play League. Uh, and that's what worked. that's what worked best for me. No, no, I, 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 I get you completely. I think, I think humility extends to so many, so many facets because I think, especially in, in, in league, that is a game that is ever changing. It's, it's, it's very easy to be like, if, if, if there is a, an essence of you that loses your level of open-mindedness to, to the game and its players. I think that you can very easily find yourself getting stuck in times that are no longer relevant. And at least on my end, since I, I work with this game back since, since season one, I, I, I have really, really come to terms with the idea that everything I know today might be wrong, wrong tomorrow. And even though I yeah. might hear something that might be so contradicting to what I believe in at the time, I, I, I leave a little opportunity uh, for maybe there's a situation here where I don't understand and maybe there's something for me to to learn and I think that extends to also just in general like approaching things in a way where there is something to learn from almost anyone almost mm -hmm. uh, because in, in, in essence it's like in the LEC there's only 50 players uh, at the World Championship, you have only three players in, or four players in each role that get to qualify. It's like the pool becomes more and more limited. And sometimes mm -hmm. in, in, it's very common in, in, in our, our sphere of things to like when, when someone, when we're watching other players play bad, everyone is very quick to be very inflammatory in the language. You know, I think it's part of the, the you know, sitting in a gaming chair at home culture to, to be very inflammatory in language. But I think it also yep. dismisses... Uh, you know, the level of effort, for example, a player that might be better than the player that they're watching, it dismisses the level of effort that maybe you've put in or that player has, has put in to reach that, uh, let's say, pedigree of, of skill. And I think sometimes that level of humility is also lost because there should be a sense of pride in the idea of being a top 50 player in your region where, where being in that slot is so inherently competitive. And we've mm -hmm. seen so many of our peers come and go and maybe never come again. And a lot of times players that uh, manage to fall down and they don't find a way back, they are filled with uh, a level of regret. So like, I think that humility is so essential uh, in a game that is ever changing, in a sport that is ever changing, because the landscape is always shifting. It's like when I was playing back in season one, two, we were just gunslingers, you know, it was, it was ridiculous uh, in terms of the professionalism that has leveled up in 10 years. There's a lot to go, uh, but mm -hmm. losing that open mindedness can really, really lose you, uh, lose your whole career very, very fast. Definitely. 100%. I wanted to I think ask so. you. Oh, go, oh, ahead, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. I, 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 I wanted to add. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think my biggest strength that I had coming as an up and coming player is when I would listen to people give feedback on like Reddit threads. Um, I would take it on. I, I would take it at face value. I would. I would read, for example, some guy like, "Wow, this guy is so bad. He's in thing." Hmm. And I read it and I think to myself, first before I was like, "Yeah, this guy is silver. His opinion doesn't matter." Hmm. First, I would pause and think, "Does he have a point?" Can I do better? 
And then I'd go like, yeah, well, yeah, I can, but he's still silver, and you know, that would be the way to cope, you know, it's like, well, he's yeah. silver, and you know, at the end of the day, like, whatever Elo he is, like, it doesn't matter, right? It's like, hey, he's probably not as good as me, so at the end of the day, like, I still feel good about the fact that, like, I'm good at the game. Hmm. However, I do recognize I can do better, and like, having someone just, like, call you out for being shit, that's a pretty small price to pay for, for, for receiving that inflection, you know? Like, hmm. it's, it's, it's free, you know? Someone called me shit, but at the end of the day, he, he did remind me that I can do better. Hmm. I just wanted to add that, you know, a lot of people, they look at their past achievements to, like, they look at past achievements to define uh, current performance. That's not how it works. Do, do you think that's why, uh, it's like, it's, it's weird because there's like super teams are built, but super teams is such a strange phrase because the assumption mm -hmm. I think in a lot of cases is that um, it's like performance remains the same for each player regardless of the environment. It's like I made this mistake back in 2019 where I brought in Mowgli to the team. Mowgli was fantastic on Africa. He was like the, the player that carried them through groups uh, like 2018 and then lo they lost mm -hmm. to C9, right? They were a very terrible team, but he was insane. We had a good relationship with Mowgli because we booked out with Africa. And then, you know, I placed, mm -hmm. placed this young player between Jizuke and Cabo who have very, very unique habits and in terms of how they uh, get in form. And Mowgli came from an environment where he was the young brother of the team where, you know, uh, Kuro took care of him and, you know, they always, he always had players, his big brothers always taking care of him, making sure that he got shit done. And he, I just placed him in a completely foreign environment and I was hoping that his performance would uh, replicate mm -hmm. itself based off of his past performances. But the details of, of why a player performs is, is so circumstantial unless they are an elite player that are good enough to form an environment in a way where they know Oh, this is what is missing for me to perform in this context, and mm -hmm. I'm, I, and and you, like, there's very very rare players. Very few players are are strong enough, strong willed enough to actually convince and also to convey uh, that level of uh, knowledge to tie everyone together. Right? It's very very rare. In the context yeah. of, of 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 super teams, uh, I, I'm trying to remember why I wanted to bring this up. Why did I want to bring <laughs> this up, Whipple? I don't know. What was the last was thing listening. that you said in the previous uh, previous uh, conversation? I said that um, I basically said that. Oh, wait, now you, <laughs> you've got me thinking about my response to what you were saying, and I forgot about what I was saying as well. Um, I think what I the point I was trying to make is that uh, people look at past performance to define their current yes, performance. That's the and one. like <laughs> people talk too much about what a player is capable of instead of what they're actually doing. Yes. Yes. And, I, and that and applies I, to me too. That applies to me too. I think people give me way too much credit sometimes for like what I can do compared to what I'm actually doing on the rift. Mm. Okay. I guess so that was the point I was trying to make. I I I think I, I I catch myself doing that for other players, especially mm -hmm. for players that I've worked with, because I know so much deeper what they are capable yeah. of. So I I, yeah. I see things through rosy glasses in a way, but. I can see the so I can easily imagine the circumstance where Whipple's going to one v nine. I like very sure. easily uh, imagine that circumstance, you know. And if you don't, I can also imagine what's missing, you know. Yeah. And uh, the reason I want to bring this up is because, like, you know, when when super teams so so called are built, for example, like the the Vitality roster or even the the most recent roster of yours, right? It's like the rosters mm -hmm. are being put together with the hope of each player being able to replicate past performances in the in an entirely new uh, context. And usually mm -hmm. that is weighed off of past performances. Do you think mm -hmm. when, when, when super teams are built, what, what, what do you think are the, the biggest mistakes that are occurring? And uh, ideally, like I haven't uh, had a chance mm -hmm. to really talk to you about what went down in TL, but that on paper looked like such a fucking monster of a roster you know mm -hmm. i think uh super teams don't define who carries the game early enough mm. i think that uh weaker teams like weaker individual teams they have uh, hierarchies right they're very yes, defined yes. hierarchy right like you look at sk for example like they they have a defined hierarchy of what what are people's responsibilities what are the expectations when we play league of legends right like we when we go on the rift who is gonna do the heavy lifting who's gonna uh you know set up the heavy lifting who's gonna 
Uh, everything is very clear, right? It's very obvious. Like, I mean, SK is a team where it's like, I don't know, because I don't watch them, but it's just an easy example of a team that, like, overperformed, in my opinion, right? Um, compared to, per, like, individual expectations, I think, um, of what the players um, should have been capable of. I think that's fair to say, right? Mm. I'm asking you a question. Like, yeah, I, I think that's the general consensus for SK. Is like, they, no, I, they are I, I, I more than the sum of their parts. I, I, I would agree, yeah. And uh, in this context of this, like how 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 much value are you getting compared to the sum of your parts? Because that's what the super team discussion really is, right? Mm. Um, I think that not having a hierarchy is an issue. It's the same reason we didn't have a great performance, in my opinion, is the hierarchy was just not clear. And what is this? What do I mean by that? Is like you know when you walk onto the rift, you've got players that take the risks, and you've got players that omit risk, mm. right? Pretty simple. It's the same in the same in a, in a basketball, soccer game. It's the same idea, right? You've got the people that when they have the ball and they have a chance to shoot at the goal, they will shoot the ball at the goal. Mm -hmm. And you've got players that pass the ball when they're near the goal to the guy that's going to make the goal, right? Yes, yes. And that's how it works, right? And, and, and being a role player and knowing that you are the guy that passes and knowing that you are the guy that scores, that allows you to practice constantly. Practice this interaction constantly. You're always like, if I'm always the guy that's shooting at the goal, it's very easy for me to hit the goal, right? Mm. Well, it's it's like I, I mean, it's what I do. Yes, yes. I always shoot the ball at the goal, so of course it's going to be not, not necessarily easy, but you get the idea. It's going to be easier. Yes, yes. Because it's what it is what I'm used to. It is what I'm always practicing. Whereas, like, if you're a guy that passes the ball like, half the time and scores or shoots the the ball half the time, you're going to reach in a point where. You are not an expert at anything. You are a jack of all trades, and jack of all trades are obviously a master of none, right? That's the saying. Yes, yes. So I think that um, in our team, I think if we had just picked the players that we wanted to play towards and then stuck to that the whole season, I do think our performance would have been plenty sufficient to make it to Worlds, if not be the best team in the region. Mm -hmm. But I think once we had a successful trend going on, it's like, this is how we want to play. Uh, this is what works best for our team. First and foremost, um, within the team, it was the expectations were like, we're a super team, we need to do better than this, right? We, we can't just be um, going, playing through bot and winning by farming for like, you know, I do my thing top lane, you know, Hans is farming, uh, we're playing scaling mid jungle champions, which is at the end of the day what we were best at, you know? Yeah, yeah. No shame in that. But people were making it out like there was a shame in that. They were like, yeah, for how much money everyone's getting paid, there's no way that, the, like, there's no way our super team plays like this, right? This is literally the comments that I was reading online, mm -hmm. right? And really, what I should have done was just tell everyone, like, this is bullshit. We don't get paid to, we don't get paid to win a certain way. Yeah, we it's get back paid to, to the win. initial point, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how. We get paid to win. They get the, how? Get the, the, the ball into the goal. Yeah. It's similar to how like, we do it. It's none of, none of anyone else's business. It's our business. Like, Mourinho was criticized, right, as a coach. Because of mm -hmm. how they won Champions League, it's like they they played uh, a lot of they they just counter attack heavy, and then when they scored a goal, mm -hmm. they parked the bus, and people hated him for it. But he won. <laughs> yeah. Now, now the only thing very good example. is the fact that he won. Eh? You just fucking have to park the bus. Sometimes you have to scale. <laughs> exactly. That's what worked for us best. Mm. Like, this is what in, in the meta. It's just what worked for us best, and we went away from that. I I started playing. Uh, I played Lucian Top, actually, not, I played Lucian Top that split, not because I wanted to carry the games on Lucian Top and play a ranged champion, it's actually because I thought when you blind pick Lucian Top, there's nothing he can pick to stop me. Hmm. Like he can, I can blind pick this champ and I have no counters. And I scale pretty good, so it's like, I'm always going to be useful, uh, I think if I perform well, I, I, I leverage a certain amount of pressure, but it wasn't like, I pick Lucian Top, we dive Top, we play the game through Top, like, no, no, no that wasn't the reason why I started playing it. Now, I, I played Lucian Top and then suddenly that was like, oh, that's what we need to do now, right? But really, that's not why I wanted to play Lucian. Hmm. Um, I played him just like I, when I played Jace. Um, I play these champions as, as, as champions that are immune to champion interaction. Mm. Like, they're immune to jungle interaction because they're so strong in lane 1v1 that, like, I can manage the wave at every level and you can never, you can never touch me if I don't want to get uh, like, interacted with, right? I can always push the wave and crash and leave and I can always fight people and outnumber. Like, I can always uh, hold my own 1v2, basically. Yes, yes. Um... But then I was playing it, and then suddenly it was like about playing topside and stuff, and it was just like, yeah, no, like this just isn't really it. I don't think this is what we should be doing at all. Um, but I didn't voice that. I, I was quiet because um, 
I also got caught in, in, into this, you know, this idea of glory, you know, this idea that we're better than, than what we need to be. Hmm. Right. In the sense of like, I knew or the best way for us to win. Like everyone knew it. Right. It's like, if we really want to win, well, we're going to pick a zillion draft. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's it. You know, if we're really, like, if we're playing to win, it's like we, we play a bruiser top lane, we, or like a, you know, a, a, a good scaling top laner, like an Orn, a Gangplank, you know, maybe Graves. Hmm. Um, you know, we play like a control mage, like Zillion, Syndra, Azir, uh, you know, a tank jungler ish, you know, it's a like utility jungle, and then a winning bot lane, right? That's how we win. Uh, but that wasn't good enough anymore. And I think then from that point onwards, we never really recovered, in my opinion. I don't think we really recovered as a team in Fauna Star. I mean, I guess in summer split after our bootcamp in Korea, we came in very strong. Um, but again, I think that lack of, because like, we didn't really have an identity there either. Um, you know, I was like, this is what we draft, this is how we win. Uh, that, that, that wasn't the case either, in my opinion. So I think that most super teams have that issue. Same with Vitality. It's like, who's carrying games in Vitality? Is it Upset? Is it, is it Bo? Is it Perks? Is it, is it Photon? Yeah, the answer is no one is. Yeah. Like Vitality was is such a good counter example, like not counter example, but an example of, of doing that terribly because it was a clear lack of confidence in all of those identities. It's like they, they rolled out first game of, 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 uh, of summer where they played, it's like, they played like Kindred, Milio, Lucian, um, whatever the fuck mid, and then like Gwen top. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, they have like Kindred and then Kaiser's playing range supports. And then that game, they like, they lost in like a very, very terrible fashion. I remember like there was this uh, 2v2 kill on bot that was like really pathetic. And then all of a sudden, no more range supports for the rest of the season. Uh, they just removed that from the pool and then they didn't play Kindred anymore. Next day they came in, they just slammed Sejuani and they made Photon play Orn. And then all of a sudden it's like, it was such a, they just capitulated any idea of kind of conforming an identity. And also in the previous playoffs, it was the same thing. It's like, oh, they play the game, their bot lane died level two to something, and then, oh, sell everything, where it's Nidalee time. We're playing Nidalee, <laughs> and we're just committing to this whole fucking new idea. We're like, yeah, now, nah, Bo, you're gonna carry, or now, nah, this time you're gonna carry. It's like, it was always so messy, because it's like watching Bo in, in the in the preseason, just watching his play, you could clearly see the potential of this guy. And it was it was didn't seem like there was any buy-in from any direction. They were all over the place. And I feel like there was this conflict of, oh, this is what is the best right now in the region. This is what we should be doing, or should we be conforming to make us identity unique to be the team that is the outlier in the region and just commit to the strengths of our guys. And I feel like they mm -hmm. did neither, yeah. I thought it's such a good example of it, yeah. I, I agree. I, I think to, to to like really solidify the point that I was making earlier about there are players that take the risks and there are players that avoid them. Mm. Um, being a guy that has practiced taking the the, 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 the I have an option to, to, to potentially solo kill him, or I have an option to potentially get an advantage if I play to push this wave, crash it, and harass him under tower. But instead of that, an opportunity for me to recall on a neutral wave and not lose any CS is a win. Like that mindset, because I know my jungler is going to carry if I don't fall behind. Yes, yes. Because I know my bot lane is going to carry when I fall behind. That trust and that, that, the ability to play with that type of decision making is, in my opinion, something that is, it is so understated in professional play and it is so undervalued to have players that have this mindset. Um, where they, they know to avoid risk, not because they cannot carry, but because they know that is not their best odds because their team is not built that way. And they find pride in that. You know, I found pride in that. I, I was the guy that would do that. I would play Orin and Gangplank, and instead of trying to kill my lane opponent, I'd crash my wave neutral and base 2018. That's what I did. That's what I did. I'd play Victor, and I wouldn't be hitting this guy underneath his tower and trying to kill him. No, no. Mm. I would take my recall, and I'd walk back out on the map, and I'd take tempo, and I'd walk into the topside pixel bush, and I'd drop a ward for caps because I knew when I do that, I am doing my team more of a favor than I am smacking this guy underneath his turret because it is not my game to carry. I will step up if I need to. But as a baseline, my job is to farm creeps and be strong so that when the call is made that Caps wants to fight, that Broxo is looking for an angle, that Reckless wants to group and fight, that is when I will be there, no matter what. <laughs> yes, yes. No. I'm... That is my responsibility. No more, no less. Be there when they want to do things. I love that. 
Bro, back in, like, how many things is Colossi? Like back then, like my bot lane was Freeze and Mythy. <laughs> And then I had this. I'm big fingers, Colossal. Oh my god, what a, <laughs> what a and, name. And then I had Extinct mid. Extinct back then was like one of the. I think if he continued playing, could have been one of the best Western players of all time. And it's like for me, I back then it was like, it was like laning 1v2 meta, you know? To take a jungle camp, lane 1v2. And just mm -hmm. like in my mind, I was like always, I was so happy to eat shit because knowing I knew that while I was eating shit, the enemy is eating even more shit because they are busy trying to fuck me when in reality they should be fucking these guys, you know? So I was always really, really embellishing those situations where I would be put behind 1v2. I could be like, in some games you're like 30 CS to maybe 80 CS just because of how the lane swaps played out. And I love those situations. I press tab and I feel good, you know? Just because of the context of of, of the team. So I, 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 th I think it's so relatable and i think it's so many cases is so understated because the flip side right jdg is such a good example jdg is a team that is put together of like five of arguably like best players in in their positions but it's so obvious what what each of the what what the roles within the team is yeah. it's like 369 just solid make sure that he's never a liability even though it's like in previous JDG years, it's like when they had Yagao and, and Kanavi and 369, they were always that the dynamic duo, they were diving top, and sometimes Kanavi was the one playing Belveth, and then he was playing Sejuani top, and then they kind of played in mix and four. So 369 is a fantastic player. Like I remember many years when he was uh, dominating uh, as the guy who would play top laners that would be more on the offensive side. He's not like someone that has reserved himself to just playing tanks and doing it super, super well, but it seems like the roles are very, very clearly defined and they've built that level of trust that uh, players are going to be able to deliver when they deliver on the topics that are expected of them. And that's like also a super team that is built together, but it seems like the buy-in for what that team needed to be and should be uh, was started from the get-go and they don't seem to be slowing down at all. Like they're playing the finals tomorrow, which is going to be super interesting. But I imagine them winning. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great example. I think it's, it, it is the standard for any like like because the thing is, is, people talk about super teams as if they never worked. But what was G two in 20, 2019? Yeah. What was Fnatic in twenty eighteen? Like, like before I even joined, like that was a super team, right? Mm. Soaz, Hillisang, Reckless, Caps, Broxa. That was by all means a super team. There is no way that you would call that anything but a super team, right? I think that was like a, I, I, I guess, trying to remember what the opinion of Caps was in 2017. I guess he was like the... the, the, the baby the, faker. The, the baby faker, the gunslinger, you know. I remember his rise solo kill on perks against Syndra and mid. Like he was, he was wild. I remember I go flamed. I said in an interview after like screaming against Caps and after him playing like two weeks, I was like... Uh, Caps is, is the best mid laner in, in, in Europe, like in terms of mid laning mm -hmm. and mid lane. And I got so roasted for this <laughs> for this comment because it was very clear that this guy is something special. But, yeah. But 2018, I, I'm trying to remember like which, like coming into the season, who would be regarded as like uh, the, the best team coming into it. But G2 just lost, of course, like Mithy and, 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 and Sven. So mm -hmm. I guess on paper, like Fnatic should, should have been considered uh, like the best team coming into 2018 for sure. Well, I don't know. I just know that like, you know, I, I think I considered it to be the, like, the, the most stacked team for sure. Because uh, at that point, coming for, off of 2017 into 2018, especially like I think Soaz and Reckless had so much like brand power in terms yeah, of like yeah. performance, you know, like they were such big deals. Um, Hilly like, too, Two right? of the biggest players. Hilly was up there. I think Hilly and Yankos were up there as well, but like Hilly, Yankos, Perks were up there as well. But I think like, in, and this is my anecdotal experience, right? Like I would say that in 20, like coming into 2018 off 2017, I, I actually think Soaz and Reckless were, were uh, considered to be bigger deals when it comes to actual performance. Now, a different story. Now it's 2023, of course. But uh, when I came in, I, for me at least, as a like, spectator of, mm. of, 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 of European League of Legends for the past, like, you know, since like basically season two, mm -hmm. um, at that point, I considered Soaz and Reckless to be bigger deals than everyone else um, because of the world's performances. Uh, that's really why, right? Like, even though domestically, um, Perks and G2 were performing better, um, because of the world's performances that Reckless and Soaz managed to put together many years 
in a row, I had uh, I just I cared more about their names because uh, Worlds is just that important for League of Legends, right? Yeah, yeah. No, 2017 was was a bit of a weird year. I remember for for Origin and 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 so as, but they had the the run right where they made semis. Uh, what's the semis that they made? Or... 2017 was he was playing on Fnatic. And he played the best five against RNG. Yeah, they played against RNG and they got sent home. Oh, this was shit. the this was the McDonald's reckless. 26, 2016, I think he was still on or Origin, if I'm not 2016. mistaken. 2016. 2015 was was the year where they went to pretty far with Origin. I remember yes, they had yes, the yes, group yes, yes. and they, they had the, the 2016 was the Gamsu fanatic. No, Gamsu Spirit. <laughs> Gamsu Spirit. 2016 was Gamsu Spirit. Yeah, and then 2017. Uh, never happened. 2016, yeah. I remember they lost to UL and then we both beat UL in the regional finals to, to qualify yeah. to the World Championship. Yeah, 2017 is a bit of a blur for me. I'm trying to remember why. I guess because I didn't even make playoffs on Vitality in summer. So <laughs> it was a bit Makes of a sense, year. yeah. <laughs> I was a shit year for me too. I got benched from Dark Passage after one month for Wicked. Oh, shit. <laughs> and then I went to Russia and almost got relegated. <laughs> it wasn't a very good year for me, yeah. <laughs> but I did hit rank one that year, so okay, yeah, something. Yeah, you were on the radar. Something, yeah. You were on the radar. Yeah, yeah, that that got me on the radar. It's funny. So you know, a funny anecdote is one of my, my one of my very first scrims. Um, I played um with Fnatic in 2018 uh, spring splits. It was very early on in the season. Uh, Reckless made a comment and I didn't hear what he said. Mm -hmm. But it was something like I know it was like in the context of like why are we playing Whippo if he's just going to play the same champion saw as he's going to play. Okay. And like, I didn't know what he said, and I reacted to something like, you know, like, oh man, really? Like, why are you, like, why are you trolling me? You know, and I, and like, I, I, I said that because I actually didn't hear him, and I thought he was like bullying me a bit, like, okay. like teasing me, you know? Okay. But I have no idea to this day what he said. Uh, but that stuck with me because, um, like, I didn't know what he, like, I didn't know what he said, and it stuck with me because, um. Well, you didn't know that what was he a said, really big part. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it's not me because the point he was trying to make, the point he was trying to make, I never found out what he said because I never asked, but the point he made really stuck with me, which is like, what, like, why am I playing if I'm not going to be myself? Mm. He had a very good point there. Uh, and to this day, I still believe in that point. I still believe that if you're going to be, you know, a rookie coming into a team, uh, you need to be yourself. You got there because when you're, you know, at home chilling in your chilling in your pajamas, you know, in your gaming chair and like at your desk, you did a certain thing right. That's why you joined a pro team, right? Mm. And I think that really embracing that as a player and as a team and playing through that is is the best way to to find success. Like it's it's why I think um ultimately uh Adam found as much success as he did because he's fully he fully bought in and the team he's on BDS fully bought in as well. Mm. They're yeah. still in playoffs, right? Uh, they are in 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 the top six, but he definitely okay. like he has lost some of that edge uh, because I think there's like an element of predictability that comes around it because. There's been like a halt in innovation. It's like the same rotation of of, of champs still in in contexts that are maybe mm -hmm. worse. Especially when Olaf became a lot more high profile, it it, it it hit nerves. And it's like in terms of the knowledge mm -hmm. advantage that he had is not the same. Like he was he was um, like getting solo kill against Evie, you know, and and in the like Renekton and Olaf matchup, which is a mm -hmm. very volatile matchup. But if you do, you're costing your team your whole game, right? You're, if you die one v one against Renek as Olaf, then you, you've you've it's lost a really game for your game, team. Yeah. It's 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 a big big detriment. But definitely, it's like the earlier splits. He he definitely like created an element of chaos, and uh, BDS really were doing a good job of playing around the fact that he likes TP because that also requires a, a level of of, of buy-in to make sure that you always place towards the side so he can push past the river and so forth and all those details. But mm -hmm. uh, definitely, like the the extreme case of that. Uh, young Adam. Yeah, yeah no, I, I just think that like it's a it's a good sign. You know, I do think it is on the player to to grow and eventually become capable of playing meta. I think uh, myself, for example, is a good example. I couldn't play Camille to save my life. That's mm. split, and then I played seventy or eighty games of Camille in solo queue, and 
I, my Kindle was something that people would like not want to play against. Hmm. Um, MSI, I think I played it in, at the end. Like, I didn't actually end up playing it very much, but MSI I ended up playing it. Um, and my Kindle was, in my opinion, very good um, uh, that year. Uh, that split, at least. And it's like, I think that's just what it takes. I, I think when your team gives you that trust, it, it is on you to pay it back and, and, and also show them, like, I, you don't always have to conform to me. I can also make you... Uh, I can also conform to you. Yes, yes. I think I think a big part of that is is, is like you're, you're leveraging the advantage you have through your own practice. I think that's what made us kind of awkward, like in 2018. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember like Reckless was stating in interviews as like the one team that maybe could do something to us as Vitality because of just how weird we were. And mm-hmm. it's like we inherently wanted to be weird and we had a full mm-hmm. buy-in to a very specific identity. And... Uh, we we managed to do a lot more than what was expected of us like on paper because a lot of the other teams were just kind of chasing to be copies of what you guys were right which is mm-hmm. often natural in a region when you have a team that is clearly the, the most dominant one that uh, you're going to be like conforming in some type of way i think g2 was also like kind of on the outskirts because they were trying to kind of deal with the fact that maybe their bot lane wasn't uh, well, like their bot lane was a weakness in the context of facing up against like Hilly and of course uh, Reckless at the time, and they were trying to just mm-hmm. force this funnel meta no matter what, right? But yep. generally speaking, most teams they just kind of conform and try to chase. But we we tried our best to be awkward, and uh, we had the full buy-in of, of of everyone, and we tried to hunt you down and and, and kill you, and that Bo five <laughs> didn't work, but <laughs> it was our best attempt. <laughs> Killed me a few times for sure. Yes, yes. No, the, the, I was a bit too good at taking good deaths. I was very good at it. I remember, like 2018, when when Hilly was signed. It's like I I, I had I had uh, nightmares of of Hilly because back in Roca 2015 he annihilated us. It's like I remember when I explained to 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 my players, I'm like, yo, when Hilly bases, he can be anywhere. And as I'm saying it, I'm like, why doesn't every super in the world do this? It's like, imagine when you base mm-hmm. and you're in fog of war and everybody trembles. You've, you, you've won the game by not existing. You are the Baba Yaga, you know? You, 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 are, you are the nightmare that hides under every child's bed, but you're on the rift. And as I'm explaining it, I'm like, Steve, when Healy bases on bot, you need to be scared top. And, and that's such a fucked up idea at the time. It's like to even... Uh, even perceive that that could be a real thing because back then in terms of managing waves you wouldn't be so quick to pounce and to punish and xp distribution was all together all different so you had more room to be, just be a psychopath mm-hmm. <laughs> but i remember it's like when Hiddy was in unicorns of love i felt like he was the main reason besides maybe like occasionally like i remember vg charge had like monster splits and like exile had like his champs with the cast in and like the talon like he was a niche player, but most of the time I thought Unicorns of Love, the only reason they are even in anyone's mouth uh, in the top three and sometimes in finals was because of Hilly. This guy was was crazy. So when I saw him getting signed to Fnatic, I was like, oh, fuck. So for me, he was very high profile because he was my Baba Yaga. He scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Makes sense, yeah. Yeah, oh, man. I mean, he was very good. I, um, I was not the... Uh, I never watched competitive play like super in depth, you know, I never reviewed games mm-hmm. and like understood why a player was good or whatever. Like I didn't really do that. Um I still don't. I'm not a big I'm not a big league watcher in the sense of like I'm I'm reviewing the games. I'm an enjoyer, you know, I just I'm just there for the ride, you know? Like mm-hmm. I, I'm there for the storylines, I'm there for the uh, I'm there for the the enjoyment. You know, I enjoy watching it as a as a spectator. I don't really enjoy uh grinding out the you know the thought process, the VODs, the I don't really do that. So I never really understood, you know, like what made a player great or what made him not great. You know, I didn't look at that. I just enjoyed and, and I just accepted uh, what people thought at face value. And I was like, well, it is what it is. I don't really care. You know, I don't want to waste my time thinking about it. Like, why is Hilly is, like, why is everyone like, think that he's great? Or why does everyone think Perks is great or whatever? Right? I, I don't, I don't really, I don't really mind, right? Yeah. Why, why is Reckless great? It's like, I just accept that people think they're great. Okay. They're great, you know. Like that's how I was always been, and it's like I, I don't really form my opinion until I play against the player. Okay. So uh, especially that year, right? Like I, when I came in to play with Hilly, like I didn't really have an opinion on him. I didn't have like I knew that he was well respected, and I had respect for him, of course, because you know, like he's. I knew he was good, mm-hmm. but nothing beyond that. And then uh, what I realized is actually, 
um, I really liked how he played the game. Mm. So when I was watching the, the scrims, um, I realized that like when our team wanted to pull the trigger um, and get shit done, he was the guy for the job. I always think that like when it came to proactively, you know, uh, act like actually like when it came to pressing the buttons and getting the fight started, I think that he was the most reliable um, out of any player I've played with on any team. When I needed a fight to start, there is no player that I would put my trust in more than him to pick me a good fight. You know? Yes, yes. Pray some miracles, if you will. For sure. Um, and that split, I realized that, and uh, I, I I realized that. If I become a player that ensures that he has tempo to, to be a part of that play, the game will be good. Mm. And that is why I had so much respect working with him and respect for him, and why when we played together bot lane, I think that we... we I beg, that's why I was a good bot lane with him, because that's how I, I looked at it. I, I looked at him being in my lane as my... He was my jungler. You know, he was jungler. He was my the, the primary jungler. Like, he wasn't my support in the sense of, like, He's holding my hand to lane with me and help me get farm. No, no, no. He, when he's here, it is time to get shit done, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> because um, he would often run towards mid lane and get shit done there, right? And then my job was to hold the fort, right? Like, I, I had that insight because obviously as a top laner, um, playing these control mage champions top was a big thing for me, right? I was a Vladimir player. I was a Swain player. This is what I played top lane. Yes, yes. So when I played these champions um, in the bot lane, it was very natural for me to be in, in positions that uh, were disadvantageous, right? Mm. Because when you play these champions top, you you know you get ganked a lot because they're very yes, squishy yes. and they're easy to gank, right? Um, so I knew how to manage that and make that work, and um, that's when I really you know understood like whenever he's in my lane, if you know if, if I play well and play the skirmish as well, like, there's always hope, mm. and. Um, that's something that I really missed playing with him is like, I didn't give a shit who we played against. It didn't matter. League of Legends was a game of champions and what champions could and couldn't do. It wasn't a game of this guy is good or that guy is good or this guy is bad or whatever. It, it, it had nothing to do with that. Mm. And I feel like in other teams, that is what ended up happening. Like Before I played with him and after I played with him, like it, it became more of that. It became more about like, oh, this guy's good and like, oh, we should be mindful of this guy. And it's like, no, with Hilly, it's very simple. If, if he does something illegal, the police is coming. <laughs> the po you know, <laughs> the, the side lane police is coming, you know, yes, he is yes. dead on my screen. If he is dead on my screen, he is dead on my screen. What his name tag says, inconsequential. No, for sure. Uh, and I missed that. You know, I missed that. Like, uh, it is something in gaming that I missed. I played World of Warcraft back in the day. I was a 2,500 player and I played against these rank one players that were like 29, 3K rating. and. Um, my best, my best days that I, the most fun I ever had playing World of Warcraft was, was treating those players the same way. Mm. They are good, but if they are doing illegal things, they will die trying. And it is not about their name tag. It is about the fact that they are playing a mage or a rogue or a druid or whatever. It is nothing to do with what the name tag says. It is only to do with the gameplay. And, um. Uh, uh, to, to this day, I think that is why there is a certain like magic when when Hilly takes the stage. You know, like a lot of people, they pause before they speak. You know, like a lot of people will say that he's an inter, but they know they have learned now to pause and wait to call him an inter until his scoreboard actually says zero three. They won't call him an inter before he plays, uh, especially internationally, uh, where like few players can be trusted as much as he can be to 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 make to make magic happen on the rift. You know. I, I love that about him, and, and uh, I really look for. I really hope I can I can play with him again next year. I, 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 I really I do. The, I hope so too. <laughs> I think you guys are a, a very uh, dynamic duo. I think last year was 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 harder for Hilly because it's like we had so many experienced players that have like everyone had won in their own way, right? Mm -hmm. And then we didn't have any time in the preseason. Uh, to to set things right and mm -hmm. rather than starting from scratch and creating an environment where people could reinvent themselves people uh, took the situation for what it was and defined it th through their own rules and mm -hmm. this is where there was clashes every single day and 
at some point it went so far, which is super, super disappointing to say that it went so far that, you know, screaming less was like the most beneficial thing because it was much mm -hmm. easier when it came to the stage matches to just set all the bullshit aside because everyone's a professional that can play well. Right? Mm -hmm. I think in, in that circumstance, I think uh, Achille uh, was used to working with someone that uh, understood him and made sure that the buy-in is from everyone, you know? Because I think that in, in some yeah. circumstances, he's not the best salesman for himself, you know? You have to, you have to really, really give him the benefit of the doubt and, and, and the time to really, really elaborate on, on what he wants to do within the game. And I, think I, I agree, I agree. I think in a lot of contexts too, when, when people call him an inter, I think for us that know him, I think usually you know that he's in a state of mind where he thinks that the game is losing and he's trying to squeeze and he's trying to based off the feedback he gets from teammates and what what the direction the game is heading in he sees it as oh this is going to be the next opportunity is going to be the best opportunity we have so i'm going to try, try it because maybe we have a five percent shot here and it might look like shit. at least it's better than the three percent we're going to have later and i think there's there's definitely an element of that and i think that's most common for the super role because mickey also has those games right where the game is losing and you're just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, brawling it out and, and, and having a good time. I think what you mentioned, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting because I definitely believe, and it's so easy to just draw from history that, that Hilly is the epitome of, he doesn't give a shit who the fuck he plays against. But I also like this fact that Hilly li likes to put in the mind of the enemy that they are playing against him. Yeah. He doesn't give a shit about their nameplates, but he wants them to give a shit about his nameplates. And I feel like the series against G2, uh, where we beat them, of course, and kicked them out of the World Championship contention. I, f I felt like the way Hilly played, he was such a demon, he wanted them to dream about him. <laughs> At the end of that fucking series. <laughs> that Leona hex flash, I remember it to this day. If I can... Game five, the hex flash and the five people completely <laughs> sprinted it. Like it was, it was beautiful. Uh, I, I have this 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 phrase I remember from last year because I think Hilly, Hilly had a hard time understanding when people wanted to pressure and when people wanted to fight. I, I like humanoid was more of a he, he didn't want to waste time looking for opportunities that assumed that the enemy would make a mistake. While Hilly mm -hmm. likes to get into the mind of the enemy a little bit and, and, and fish and make them scared in every decision they make. Why humanoid is more, oh, I, I can get six, six minions here, make this wave crash over the info I got to mid. Mm -hmm. You guys can play defensive and take it easy. While, while Hidi is more of an opportunist, while humanoid is like, oh, I'm going mm -hmm. to reach this item, this item, and then I can carry the game. There's no, there's no need to, to squeeze water from stone. And I remember mm -hmm. in, in that context, I remember there was this review where Hidi is like, guys, the enemy AD has no flash. I have Giant's Belt and Ninja Tabi. I'm never going to be stronger in the game. If you don't want to fight here, then I don't know what the fuck I'm doing in this game. <laughs> was, it's, it's such a, it, was, it, was, it was such a good moment because Hideo was like, yo, you guys have items. I don't get items. He has no flashes. The strongest I will be. I want to use this. Otherwise, what the fuck am I doing? Otherwise, you need to yeah, tell me. You point, need to yeah. tell me. But you guys don't tell me. Because <laughs> it was always like just a conflict of, of 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 what the approach to the game should be and eventually like bro like our 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 identity coming into the world championship and us like limping through playoffs all the way to to like uh the the semi-finals that was like a miracle like we we were through tape and like fucking toothpicks and whatever the fuck we were holding one in peace you know it was mm. it was uh, it was it was definitely definitely something it was, uh, Makes sense. It, was, it was a crazy year. That was also like one of those circumstances where we just didn't define what what the team should have been from the get-go and what the role of what it means to be a teammate and a professional. Because uh, it's like we have one player coming from a gaming house environment where they're spending 24 hours 7 together. And then you have a different mm -hmm. player that has family obligations and a different player that has something else. And when everything shifts and the dynamic shifts, it's like, it's 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 hard if 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 not everyone and if everyone doesn't have the buy-in for what it means to be a teammate and a professional in the environment that you work in everyone's going to define them define that by themselves 
And then through that, when people are doing things maybe that you disagree with, like a little bit of resentment builds, you know? It's like, oh, this guy is contradicting what we believe is good in. And if that is not defined the same way gameplay rules need to be defined, I think this is also things that uh, build up like conflict and resentment as as, as time goes by. Because mm. it's like what it means to be a pro and what it means to be a teammate, everyone needs to be like on the same page about what that is, you know? It's like, what, what are people bringing into scrims? It's like, is one player taking whole off season off and chilling, and then he wants to start practicing when the season starts, and some player doing something yeah. different? Yeah, this is also where things uh, can can clash. True. It was, was, it was definitely like a big, uh, there was so much to take away from, from, from this last year. I think also it's like when, when we got together, right? Uh, that was, that was quite the experience. Like the first split, that was riddled with insanity. <laughs> I remember some of the conversations in in early season that I had with you and and self made and and Hilly and we were always like at at some point I remember I was talking with Dabs was like yo I guess I guess there's something that we don't know as <laughs> maybe there's something that we don't know fanatic magic they figured it out as time goes by maybe there's something here <laughs> we had like these concerns it's like these guys are beating beating us over and over again there has to be something here that we don't get. And then time goes by, and holy fuck, we were so boosted. <laughs> yep, we were very boosted. We were insanely boosted. <laughs> we were very, very boosted. Ugh. Oh, man. I, I wanted to ask you, because the, the, the Caps is a play that I, I hope that I get the opportunity to work with. Mm -hmm. Not in, in, in the essence of, I, I just want to... To, to, to see what is I want to just witness that in person you know I want to witness that in person yeah, I want yeah. to I want sure. to really really learn from it I want to soak in it and really really you know see how that is from the other side because this is this is a player that's been tough to beat uh, all of these years uh, when mm -hmm. when you think back to like caps is a player that everyone wants to play with you can sure. draw from your own personal experience, of course you've you've had the privilege of playing with him and then the next year also against him in 2019. Uh, what, what what how would you describe caps as, as as a player and a teammate and his, his his love for the game like that's that's the main thing that always stands out it just seems like he fucking loves the game mm -hmm. yeah he does i mean i think the biggest strength he has is that um like he takes uh i he makes the game about him you know he knows he's very good and he knows that like, he has the same uh, kind of it doesn't matter who I play against, it's more about champions. It isn't about, like... like the game is just as a baseline. All about what he can do and what he cannot do. And I think the beauty of playing with Caps is what he cannot do is very few. <laughs> very few things. Right? Like, I think he goes above and beyond to play the game as, like, a... For me, playing the game is very much about like interacting with the enemy team, interacting with your team. And I think that out of all players that play mid lane, Caps is the absolute number one at playing with his own team. I think he goes above and beyond to make sure that the game is in a good state and, and that he is uh, participating with uh, the rest of the members of the team uh, in their win condition. And, and, and he really, really values... Um, being a part of that, I feel when I when I worked with him, you know, like uh, I always felt like he was a part of the game. Mm. I felt like when Caps was not a part of the game or actively pushing to be a part of the game, that was when something was very wrong. Mm. That's when he was struggling. Uh, why or how? I don't know. I didn't know all the all the time, but Caps was always a part of the game in voice, like in communication during the game, in 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 every way, shape, and form. Caps was, I guess he, he was like he's like the heart, you know, he's the heart. Mm. The central, the central piece. He's really a mid laner, I guess. Like he he is <laughs> the center of the game. You know, the center of, of everything that goes on that is positive in the game. Um, he is a part of it, and everything that goes on that is negative in the game, he is also has his hand in. You know, and not in a way that he's necessarily the cause for it, but he will make sure that he compensates for that. Right? Like if something is going wrong in in one of the lanes, like he will, he will go there and he will make it easier for them to 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 lane. Um, he will take over that lane, and or he will help that lane by ganking that lane, or mm. you know, really, I think um, that view of like being a part of the game 
and like really viewing the game as a team game and like this is what I can do for the for the state of the game. Um, that is what makes Cap special, extra special. Because obviously his mechanics are fantastic, right? Mm. Guy individually is crazy good. Yes, yes. But I think the way that he includes the jungler in the game, the way that he includes the mid laner in the game, oh, sorry, mid laner himself in the game, <laughs> um, it's really special. You know, like I remember when 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 working with him with with Hilly in 2018, like Brox and Hilly. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, uh, a big part of why like playing through mid was as successful as it was is because he was very good at letting people know when they were needed to be there and when they did, did not need to be there. Mm. Um, that said, I do think that um, you have to play through him in order to get those qualities. I, I do not think that um, he is nearly as good of a player when you do not actively play through him. And I think that's when, like, whenever he had weaker splits, is that was what was happening, right? Is that we the team that he was on was like, either the meta didn't really support playing through mid, or um, you know the team he was on couldn't find a way to make that work because you know other places perhaps were suffering too much or or whatever. Uh, in order to get the most out of caps, one the game has to revolve around him, and when it does, he spreads that around. Right, like, everyone feels that. Everyone knows the game. Like he's in the game when 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 the game is being played through him, basically. And I think that is uh, the number one reason why he is as big a deal as he is. Because he's obviously a huge deal, right? Yes, yes. No, it's at a, this point, I would say he is uh, probably the greatest of all time Western player. Should be, yeah. I I, I think. Right now, as as DS continue, the argument arguments just become stronger and stronger for him. Yep. I think, even even to this day, I, I think it's 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 so true what you say because uh, I can think of games from from each year uh, of 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 Caps like legendary run throughout the last years, where this is so true. Like even as so as as recent as the the Bo Five against XL, I remember there was this game where he played Nico. Randomly got a solo kill, not randomly, I played the guy, got a solo kill on Nico against Azir, like level 4. And then the game was mm -hmm. just over, because he knew how to convert that into something that impacted everyone. He just knew how to win win the game through that. And yep. I remember as well, when we prepared against uh, you guys in the regular split, it's like we, we, we had secret weapon Zack <laughs> prepared against Caps. Because we, we knew that yeah. he, he hated this champ, so we just camped the shit out of him. Level 3 gank, level 2 gank, and hope that we put caps behind in some shape or form. I remember one, we lost like a 60 minute banger against uh, Caps Corky and Reckless Tristana, but it was it was worthy of the attempt. How, how did you, after playing with him 2018 and then shifting over to 2019, as, as a top laner, did you feel... Uh, was there anything in your approach that you, like, your knowledge of Caps, the intricate details of it, did, did you leverage it in any shape or form uh, as you played those those best of five series that went always to five games against G2? No, I don't think so. I, I, I you know, I just, uh, I think we were very fortunate in having Nemesis. I think Nemesis was uh, one of the few players that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him mm -hmm. um, in an individual sense. Uh, I think what I knew, like, I knew it, but I didn't realize it, is like, I think I played too much for advantage in 2019. I think I should have been happy with just playing for uh, equal game states and then uh, translating, like, and then having other people profit from that and just being less vulnerable. I think Yankos and Caps got the, <laughs> got the best of me a few too many times when it comes to ganks, because I was trying too hard to try and leverage my advantageous positions uh, when I had them, which wasn't always, right? That, that's why it's like, it was a rare thing. Um, playing against G2 to be in an advantageous position against uh, Wunder and, and that lineup, right? So when I got the opportunity, I always wanted to make it count, and I think that's w one of my regrets uh, playing that year. Is like I, I, I should not have been, been, been aiming for that nearly as much. It, it should have been more about uh, ensuring that the game was stable rather than trying to murder them. Mm. But uh, I wanted to murder them real bad. <laughs> like that, I think that's like also one of the beauty, like one of the reasons why it was so fun to watch this and why the rivalry was a thing is I, I do truly believe that both teams really wanted to kill each other. Like in game, of course, you know. Like I think we were we were going at each other's throats. Like I don't think we we personally had any issue with each other. Like we we could all be in the same room and have a good time. But like when it came to the League of Legends, like both of those teams had for whatever reason. I think we were trying to prove each other something. At least 
On Fnatic side, that was definitely true. Perhaps G2, not as much. But I, I, have, a, I have an inclination to feel that that was also the case. Just because, like, I don't know, I don't think I've ever played series of, of best of fives over a multitude of games. Like, I've played bangers against teams, you know? Like, I remember, like, Vitality, for example, I was playing a Swain game, and, and when I was playing bot lane in summer, and it was like, I had, like, this was the game I had the most DPM I think I've ever had. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a complete stomp, like, we were just murdering yeah, everyone. Yasuo, Trundle, Swain, Pike, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, the Goon Squad, that's what we call it, the Goon yes, Squad yes. going on. Like a full death ball melee comp. And um, I would say personally, like that happened, but I've never had since then like series where like this was just continuously the case. Like where like both teams were at each other's throats over years, you know? Like I, I, I don't remember a game against G2 where like one of us went went out quietly, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like sure there were games where we got stomped, fewer games where G2 got stomped, but I think that happened too. Um I guess it was a but one, never two, three, without three, a fight. finals. That was that was one that was rough. I remember that. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. That one but was we rough. Can, we can omit that one. <laughs> no, 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 like, I don't mind. You know, it's a part of history for me. You know, it's just like I remember some some best of ones where we had some some some, some really good games where we yes, we, yes. we shut them down. Um, I remember your Renekton solo killing caps. Akali that was the one I was swap. thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, there, were, there were a few. There were a few yeah, where we had like where we had their number and we called it. But I, of course, I need to defend my honor there. I, 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 they did exist, and just you know, um, if I think about it, like we were always at each other's throats. Either way, um, is what it felt like at least. And, and I, I haven't had that experience. I haven't seen that in any in any rivalry ever. Actually, like even the telecom wars, I don't think they they, they ever were like fighting to the death like we were. Um, which is, I think, a big reason why everyone loved watching us play. You know, like w w when we when we took the stage, even if it was one sided, you knew that it was going to be a slaughter. You know, <laughs> champions were going to die left and right either way, and um, I really loved that. I guess I I, I didn't love that in the moment because I usually lost, but <laughs> I love it now that I'm thinking back to it. Good memories. No, 2018 and 2019 were definitely like very beautiful years in terms of like what the LEC was because like those matches were like real events because through, throughout those times especially in 2019 it was it was not disputed at all that that these are the two teams that that you are that you want to pay attention to uh because mm. because both roses were so so damn stacked and uh it was always so damn close I remember. Also, uh, we were also like it was like I, I think we always lived up to the expectations as well. I, yes, I yes. think that like I think there's very few games that people came to watch like in person, uh, especially that people regretted showing up to a Fnatic or G2 finals. You know, yeah. especially when we both played. Um, obviously, the 2021 in spring was pretty it was pretty dirty on my part. I think I I, <laughs> I was running it down that series pretty bad, <laughs> um, but. Especially 2019. I think anyone that came to, to watch that one uh, has no regrets. Mm. Neither do I. You know, like I, I don't have any regrets playing that. Like I have regrets because I lost, but I don't have regrets in, in how hard I tried. Mm. Um, I really, I gave it my all. I'm glad to hear that. As legendary is legendary is. I'm I'm, I'm yeah. curious. I'm curious about something. Um, you. It's like you played against the shy. Did you play against in 2019? You played against in 2019, no? You played the 1v1 tournament. So you played yeah, against I did. in 2019 They're too. True. Does, does I this did, count? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Like uh, I, 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 I like I mentioned that I killed, that I beat him 1v1, but you know, it's like yeah. Well. Did you beat him? What did you play? I remember you played. Did you play? I Olaf? played Pantheon. I played Pantheon of and played like Pantheon. Pantheon. I played Pantheon into Irelia and Olaf into Fiora. Yeah. And then, he beat me when I played. Um, sure, I think I played Hecarim or something into him in my first. No, I played Lee Sin into Lee Akali Sin. and I like, completely griefed it. I kicked him before. Like the, the whole point was to survive until I had like the circle, and then I kick him out of it, and then I kicked him like because I panicked. Oh <laughs> shit! I I kicked him like too quickly. I also like I had a solo Kalangal and I missed it. Uh, I was pretty sad about that. Were you honorable, or did you buy Hex Drinker and? Uh... I bought Mold Mamordius and I still choked. <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> <laughs> that's why i was so cringe because like i I, could, I was like i kicked him and then like i i lived for like 30 seconds afterwards but like i couldn't beat him because 
uh, like I wasted all my tools trying to like burst him, and I really should have just been uh, just punching him to death, you know. Ah, I choked completely. God, it's crazy I wasn't that you remember it so specifically. <laughs> sure, I remember many. Like, if I think about it, I can remember almost, like, any big... Like, obviously, it was a big deal for me because, uh, you know, like, these are some of the most legendary players at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, if not to this day, like, Uzi, the shy, like, you know, obviously, like, the, I don't remember my 1v1 against Fofo as well, you know, no offense, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually thought he was an AD carry player. I was like, Baffle, he could play Aurelia as well as he could. You know, I was like, what the fuck? This guy is an AD player and he plays Aurelia this well? This guy's cracked. And then like someone told me, that guy's a mid laner. And I'm like, oh, really? No wonder. <laughs> that explains why he was that good at Aurelia. I, I, wanted to bring up, I, I wanted to bring up the shy because I'm curious because this, this guy is a phenomenal, right? At least when, yeah. I, when we screamed this guy 2018, I played with six games against him. I was, I was very... It's like sometimes you... you, you it's like play against someone or you see someone play and it's kind of like it it it, it stops time for a moment and you're like whoa whoa like players are gonna need to catch up to this and it's gonna happen a little bit slower than with others so i i got this feeling from watching rookie that same year i got that feeling from watching deft and mata play that year uh, mm -hmm. on on katie like i thought they were phenomenal i remember like watching bin play camille in just solo queue i was like jesus well, what is mm -hmm. what is this? I think you showed me Bin Kamil. Maybe it was you that showed me Bin Kamil. Very uh, possible. I uh, after twenty twenty worlds, I was very impressed with Bin. Bin, Bin, you, you, we are both avid uh, Bin enjoyers before before it was cool. But the shy, you you got to play against him in one v one. You beat him in one v one. You played against him twenty eighteen too. Um, what 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 are, what are the memories that you recall uh, playing against the shy? I know we had conversations about not giving shit about nameplates, but. Uh, was it something that stood out to you? No, I mean, he was just very good. I remember actually the the the, the number one story that I have remembering the shy and and what he what he was like playing against him was actually in 2019. I played Lucian versus Gangplank. He played Lucian side. I played GP side. Obviously, you know me being mm. the GP enjoyer I was 2019, 20, 2018. Um, I played GP versus Lucian, and that was the first time I've ever had a Lucian dash through my barrel. Oh, yeah, and it, 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 and I knew it was intentional because he was playing for it. And uh, don't get me wrong, I was crushing him in lane, and then mm. he did that and made me go like, "Wow!" So this was he, scrims, he sees right? that angle. This was solo queue, even solo you know, like queue. that's the thing. Yeah, in solo queue, uh, screaming him. I honestly I don't remember too well because we played so many games against each other. But I just knew like, he was very good. Uh, but you know, I I think, <laughs> think we were just both fighting each other to death. I don't know. I just had a, I had a thing for fighting people to the death. I still do, I guess. Um, <laughs> when I was at uh, Worlds events, like I fought Nugri to the death every scrim we played against him. I fought him to the death every scrim we played. Uh, there's a few players I did not fight to the death. Um, and uh, when I was playing against him, I just remember he he was very, very good at finding angles that surprised me. You know? Mm. Uh, and that was not easy to do. Like I think surprising me, finding an angle that surprised me, not easy to do. But I, I, I will say that out of all players I've played against, he was the best at surprising me. Mm -hmm. With like, I thought I was in a winning position, but then he played it in a way that made me go like, that's a thing? Okay, <laughs> I have to account for this now. You know, I have to account for this now. Um, and then I think, you know, because we were talking about Bin, Bin was, I think, the, the number one player that stood out to me as the guy that made me go like, I have to relearn this matchup. <laughs> <laughs> there's very few players because i think that's a big thing when you go to to like to, to korea to china that you have to relearn a matchup yeah, because yeah. like uh, people played much better mm. uh, it was a very rare thing for me to have to do that during a tournament but mm. when i played against him it was like i was during the tournament i was like okay if i if, if this guy if i'm meeting this guy i have to put in a lot of hours to see what the fuck this jack's champion does because <laughs> i did not think jacks did what this guy is doing right now <laughs> Um, especially Jack, he didn't play much Camille against me, but that's also because uh, that Worlds, I was I was very well versed in, in Camille, Renekton, Camille, uh, Volibear, of course, that was my, my bread and butter. Yes, yes. Um, so I also think that, like, in a way, uh, teams avoided that matchup, because it's something that I played on stage and I was successful doing on stage. Uh, I think Asian teams are very wise in this, they're very, very smart when it comes to drafting, so much more so, I think, than people give them credit for. When it comes to, at least in those years, I can't speak for the recent years, but when it comes to attacking uh, teams, with information from scrims, 
Uh, I actually genuinely think Asian teams know how to make players uncomfortable um, and, and know how to, you know, attack the bums and, and, and pick the champions that that make life a little bit, like, that little bit extra miserable, you know? Hmm. I think there's definitely, like, two, two, two sides of it. I think when, it, it seems to me when, when they, it, 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 it's kind of weird, but it feels like it depends almost on your seeding. Because cause I feel like they take, in, in my experience, although like very anecdotal, it's like depending on the, the pedigree that your organization carries and the seed that you come in, they're going to view you very differently. I example, see that. Yeah. For example, when we played against RNG, they just let open Draven and all that jazz. And it's mm -hmm. like a simple game of legends uh, lookup would say, yo, uh, either you prepare something very specific against this or you just... Uh, remove these guys weapons because we we got like draven thresh rise zinza which was legit like all our otps uh, coming into that yeah yeah, yeah. makes sense yeah. Uh, <laughs> and i think that was based on the fact that we had a very specific seed but i think also uh, i can i can definitely think of moments in time where they like broke teams uh the 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 the, the, the eastern uh, regions for sure i guess the, the the easiest one to 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 pluck away from in the in the past is when um, during this time you didn't even play but uh, SK they were like 8-0 and zero in LEC and then they played IEM and then I believe Ku Tigers just banned 3 ADs against Forgiven and then SK lost and then they came back to Europe all the teams in Europe did the same and then they started the lose streak which was which is kind of hilarious but this is like the example that stands out to me the most because they kind of broke broke that identity uh, apart uh, all, all together and additionally, like you remember when like when we both camp in Iceland, Shaves is like, yo, these guys between the sets, they're looking at our level one and then they are taking a big shit on our level one in the second set. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they are they are actively studying us and uh, flexing and, and training that muscle to be adaptable and to prepare like a, like a knife in sharpen a knife in the dark. Cause, Cause that's the, the, there's a muscle to it too, you know, too. Mm -hmm. uh, adjust depending on the information that is given to you. So definitely, I think I, I I agree with the notion that sometimes things are oversimplified. When I think a lot of Eastern teams, especially when there is a world's winner, it seems like they have established a very good pattern for themselves, and they limit themselves within that pattern. And certain the players have certain roles in 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 winning that championship. Because it's always, mm -hmm. always seems almost formulaic in terms of how a team plays that wins the world championship. I think that can be said for every world champion. I, I can't think of one that uh, was so dynamic that they did everything. I agree. Uh, I, I have, like, I remember 21, like you mentioned Iceland, uh, 2021 Worlds. It's like no one would ban junglers. And then I walk on stage and suddenly Jarvan and Vigo are out first three. Yeah. And I'm like, wait. I'm like, wait. <laughs> I I have not walked into the same with IG. I, no one banned Victor in scrims. Suddenly, I walk on stage. Victor is out first three, and I'm just like, oh. Like I've been scrimming with Victor open all this time, and suddenly he's just not there for me. Mm. Like, I it completely changes your perspective on what you want to draft, right? And like, they knew that we prioritized Aurelia. They knew we prioritized Urgot, and they gave us both. And pick neither, and they played Sion Lissandra game one, and it's just like, mm. no. Thinking back to it, it's like it's genius because they know we're going full AD because you know we didn't really play any EP junglers. Like, I think that whole tournament, I don't think we played a single one, if, if I'm not mistaken. I, that's what I remember at least. And it's like, you think about it, like it's very, very smart drafting. You know, um, not in the, like maybe not in the like in the sense of like unique or anything, but with with, with the tools available and what was defined as the meta. Uh, they definitely showed a certain mastery over it, uh, which, in my opinion, is, is quite impressive. Do you think? Do you think metas make world champions, or do world champions make metas? I think metas make world champions. I think at the end of the day, people show up to the world championship with what works for them, and you go and play. And if the meta suits you, you win. And if it doesn't, you are either really great and you go top four, top, top, you know, like you go top four, maybe top eight, you know. Um, but I do think at the end of the day that you show up as a team that is good at something and you, you win if it suits you. And if it doesn't suit you, you are just going to have to come back next year.
<laughs> I, I I think that is why we don't see like repeating world champions is something that we haven't seen since SKT basically, right? I think uh, does Damwon have two titles or only one? They, uh, they have they have the, one title and another finals, right? Yeah, yeah. They went they won and then the MSI finals and then of course world finals and they lost the EDG. But yep. but the interesting thing is that they kept the same identity, right? All the way all the way through to their last BO5 and their last match. Their yep. identity stuck through one hundred percent. I think that's why uh, it's it's like I remember Samsung had the same right twenty sixteen finals and then twenty seventeen wins. Um, yes, yes. But this, I, I believe that they were a very similar team through and through as well, and that's why I think that like metas are just you know uh, the the teams that come to the World Championship they are they are playing their game, and then uh, if it suits the the meta suits them, they will win, and if it does not, they will not. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that is my experience uh, over the years. No, I I I am inclined to 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 agree. I I think there is an element of the other side too, but very, very limited. Because I think still like regionally, uh, especially if it's not the LPL, I think that, uh, for example, when G2 were winning um, back-to-back splits uh, in 2016 and 2017, I think for, for the longest time, they ran the region in a way uh, where they just had strong enough players and strong enough knowledge to be able to run the region uh, whichever way. And I think that inherently hurt them when they got to the international tournaments because mm-hmm. they were not defined in their ways the same way, I would say. Yep. Because that G2 I roster agree. did actually have like pretty terrible performances besides, I guess, in 2017 where they made MSI um, finals. Uh, I guess that, mm-hmm. was, that would be like the standout. Yep. So, I think it's it's it, it is kind of funny that the, you 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 put yourself at so much mercy of, of of the patch and you put yourself at a lot of risk and if if you were in a hypothetical situation and you had uh, uh, you you've won two splits you have four weeks to to prepare and let's say you played a very bot bot side centric. Um, uh, game that has uh, gotten you two championships and then you have four weeks to prepare and then you walk into the world championship and then everything points in the other direction what just basically based on this hypothetical scenario what 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 does your gut tell you that is the correct idea to do of course there's a lot of variables but no i mean it's it's exactly what we did in 2018 uh funny enough it's just keep playing through bot lane and um the thing, the reason why, uh, I mean, so, again, I, I still think you should keep pl- playing through bot lane with, with, a, with a twist. And what is this twist? It could be a draft twist, right? It could be you, you, you triple down, you know? Like, suddenly your drafts aren't like, oh, we play through bot with the scaling bot lane. No, no, we play through bot with, like, fucking balls to the wall Draven, you know? Like, we're a Draven team suddenly, right? Like, you have that time to prepare that, that twist, you know? And I think you should come in with a twist, right? Like I'm a big believer of opening best of fives, especially, but even best of ones in in world groups with 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 spice. You know, mm. you come in and you remind people like you thought you thought you knew what we were about, but that's not the full picture. You know, like we we've prepared something special. Um, so I think you should still be a bot centric team, and I think that we did a good job of that. Um, uh, playing in in 2018 is is a good year of example of that, right? Like mm. the meta suddenly shifted. Um. That said, I think at that point we were more like a, we play into mid team um, because obviously I was the, the bot laner for the majority of summer. Um, yes, yes. So fortunately, we had the whole summer split to practice and change because we had a different player playing, right? So the dynamic of the team changed, and then it was more about reckless adapting to that dynamic, and then also finding his own place and what that looked like. Mm. Um, that said, I, like I said, I think you just fully commit and you just accept that like this is this is what we've practiced the whole year. Uh, I don't think you 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 flip your strategy on the head. Uh, I think you just accept that like making it out of groups is an achievement. There is no way around that. Being the top eight best team in the world, no matter what sport you play, that is that is an honor. You know, like that is there is no shame in that. And uh, you try your best and you play your best game. And I think at the end of the day, rather than risk not making like you know what i mean like you you should just look at the 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 next game ahead of you you shouldn't be looking about you shouldn't be looking at world championship in the sense of i'm trying to win it all i'm making decisions to win it all i i try i did this in 2020 2022 you know it's like you know i'm 
I'm making this decision because in the long term this will be more rewarding. Like I don't believe in that anymore. I never, I didn't in the past, and I don't anymore. I don't believe in decisions for for the future. I believe in winning the game that's ahead of you. Mm. Whatever that takes, you do it. No questions asked. No, no, no BS. No nothing. Just focus on the very next game that's ahead of you, and do your absolute best in winning that. No more, no less. And um, I think if you're a bot center team that's been playing like that the whole year, you you commit to that. Uh, like I said, maybe you you know maybe you play a different jungle, like you have a different jungle pool that's very good at diving bot lane. Like you suddenly like you're not a volleyball team. Like for example, we were in a volleyball team, right? Mm. I didn't play volleyball. I fucking hated playing volleyball jungle. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't believe in it, you know. Um, but suddenly we go to Worlds, and I'm suddenly a volleyball player, you know. Like suddenly, like we've practiced so much against these scrims, and suddenly my volleyball is what people fear, you know. Like they're like, oh fuck, this guy is gonna pick volleyball. And tar- like game one of groups, you show up. You play against X, like whatever team you show up, you tower dive their bot lane twice in five minutes, and they're like, what the fuck just happened? Yes, yes. We had scouting that this guy is full clearing every game, and suddenly this guy is in my tower, tower diving me perma. Mm. How is this possible, right? Mm. So the one that, is, that is what I think you should be doing. The same style, but either very extreme, or you pull back a little bit, you know? But the same idea, like, you pull back and, like, you either go hard into scaling or hard into very aggressive early games. I think I think that's the only... I, I, I fully agree with you, because I think that's the only way that is... It, it's, it's the only way that you can become good enough because your distribution of time needs to be at that level of precision. Because if you waste the majority of your year... So usually the teams that are winning, they stay winning throughout the year because they have aligned and they've they've maneuvered their time appropriately it's mm-hmm. it's, it's 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 very rare that you're in a circumstance where a team wins one split and then they completely uh, fall off sometimes that is the case it's like could be that a team put in a lot of effort in the off season and they overdid uh like in terms of for example g2 i think in um the, the time they had Targamas and Flacket, I think that that roster wasn't so strong, but they managed to win because of their efforts in the, in, in the preseason. But it's like in terms of how you how useful you make your time throughout the year is something that is so essential. Because if you are left there playing catch up, and you are taking shortcuts and you're making band aid solutions for things that you know will not lo- last in the long term. I think when you find yourself in that position, then you know that uh, you are kind of, you're going to be stuck in what your current form is, rather than be able to, being able to break through and re-innovate yourself coming into the World Championship. Because that was definitely true for us last year, where we walked into the World Championship, the same exact team that played best of five against XL, and that is like a disappointing thing. Because mm-hmm. th- there should be an elevation of what your performance is, and the last game that you play of a season should be your absolute best game of the season. This is like what I truly, truly believe. It's like the last game you play of the season eventually will come, and that better be the best best game that you played. I can respect that, yeah. I think that's what we are, everyone tries to achieve. Of course, it isn't always easy, but yeah. It is tricky. It you, is tricky. You, you, you mentioned Nemesis. But Nemesis is so interesting to me. It's like I, I had a run in with Nemesis. I remember like he, he was not so happy because I mentioned like I, I there was this best of five where he was super super far ahead on Akali, and I made this off the cuff comment. I was like, oh, if he played these fights better, I think Nemesis really could have carried the game, and maybe he could have won the series for Fnatic. And uh, he didn't. He, he wasn't so happy because probably from his perspective, he saw the details of an in and out, and there's a lot, a lot going on. You know, maybe someone else in his eyes entered and so forth. He was very happy. He was like, oh, this guy, what the fuck is he saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was my only run in with Nemesis, and then I've uh, I've had the pleasure of playing with him sometimes, like Pummel Party or whatever. And uh, I know also mm-hmm. Shaves. Shaves always. I, I, when Shaves tells me something, I believe Shaves. You know, Shaves has told me so much about Nemesis, and I, I know for a fact that this 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 player is is, is a player that is, that is super super strong. I have also watched his solo queue, like in terms of a stream. I think this is a very very solid player. I wanted to bring him up with you because I remember when I joined the team. You know, I joined the team uh, uh, between 2020 and 2021, and that was a chaotic chaotic. Uh, uh, 
very, very chaotic environment to jump into because I, I didn't have much input on how the offseason would be playing out. And uh, the conversations I had with, with all of the players, with you, with Reckless, with Hilly, they were all over the place. Self-made too. I was, I was like, what the hell did I jump into? <laughs> it was a chaotic environment. And I, I, I know from, from speaking to you that the, the, these, I guess, the, the years beyond that have been very, I guess, introspective for you, Bwip. It seems like you have been yeah. very, very reflective and you've taken the time to actually look at the details of what you've been through because you were you went through so fucking much your first uh three years of play it's 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 crazy how much you went through you know that's that's like 15 careers already there <laughs> and I, I i say all of this because i am curious to 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 hear uh your thoughts surrounding nemesis uh because i i i would love to see him back in pro play i want to see you back in pro play i know this is going to happen and if the right things uh, you know appear it's going to happen but uh, can you tell me about mm -hmm. nemesis from your perspective because i have the shapes perspective <laughs> only <laughs> yeah i don't know i think he's just like i think he's very good he's very smart about the game um i don't know i only have good things to say really so um what to say specifically is hard to pinpoint because i think like he's just a very well-rounded player in my experience uh, i think that uh leaving pro play also gave him a, a you know a level of maturity mm um that i also have achieved you know a very like a, a period of inflection you know it's like I, I regret not doing certain things or when i talked to him like he, he told me as well you know it's like things that i've genuinely didn't want to do at a certain point because i just didn't believe in it at all i didn't buy into it at all and, and i i would never have um you know I, I i changed my mind on that perspective you know now i'm willing to do those things you know i'm willing to to put myself out there and do things that I didn't believe in back then, uh, because I understand that, that that isn't the only, you know, that there's more to it, basically, right? Mm. So, um, you know, to give you anything concrete, it's hard for me to say. I think he's just a great player. And, like, I enjoyed working with him because uh, when push came to shove, he would... He wouldn't stop, you know? Like, he would keep trying very hard. I think Worlds 2020 was, like, a breaking point for him. Where, like, you know, both, especially physically, I think, he was genuinely struggling. Um, because he just couldn't, he couldn't adapt to the diet uh, in China. Yeah, those stories are fucked up, by the way, like. And I, you know, and I really, uh, I really regret that I didn't take a moment to, like, you know, just be there for him, you know. Uh, and I think that at the end of the day, I think he's a super well-rounded player that, you know, like, I think any team would be happy to have him. I, I don't think he is as rigid as he used to be, uh, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing, sure, right? Like, it, it's not necessarily a positive thing, um, because at the end of the day, he is also um, like being rigid and, and, and knowing what you're good at and sticking to that is a strength, in my opinion. So that isn't necessarily a, only a good thing, but I think in, in, in this context, it is a good thing because I think he has the talent to play whatever you need him to, right? And, and that's the thing, like he showed that in his career, right? In 2020, 2019 uh, spring, for example, the reason why I think our team revitalized is because we found a way to include Nemesis in every play when, when he played Silas and Lissandra. And, and, and that's what we needed to keep our proactive early games alive, you know? Like we needed that proactivity because um, we were struggling to find it in other places. So. Um, I just think, you know, long story short, he's a great player and I'd love to work with him again because I think that he's one of the few players that I worked with that um, like really, like, he, he redefined what putting in the hours really meant to me, you know? Um, uh, he, he, uh, how, how, can you elaborate? I imagine now, yeah, sure. you know, like uh, he puts in the scrims and then he's there doing the solo queue, but maybe there's more to it. It's really like, even though he disagreed, it didn't stop him from doing what, like, he valued putting in the hours and, 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 and the grind more than his own opinion. Okay. Like, people can grind when they believe what they grind in, right? Yeah, yeah. But that guy grinded, even though he completely disagreed on what he was doing and why. Oh, shit, like, okay. He, he, he did not believe... In, 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 you know, in, in, in a lot of what the team was trying to do. But that didn't stop him from putting in the hours. And that's what I mean by that. That redefined the grind for me, you know, because I, I could never. <laughs> I could never do that. 
Like if I didn't believe in it, but if I didn't buy in, I you you would see me slacking. And he was the opposite. It's like he didn't buy in, and he was working harder than anyone else, even though he wasn't bought in. I I, I, I respect I, that super super much. And that, like, that don't get me wrong, he made it very clear that he didn't buy in, right? So he, yeah, it yeah. was clear that he didn't. But there was no one that said that he wasn't putting in the hours. Like you couldn't say that. So. That's why it was like a very special experience for me because no one else that I've worked with was quite like that, where they made it very clear, I don't believe in what we're doing. I think this is a waste of time. Like he would audibly, like he would share, he was like, I think this is a waste of time. And yet he was the hardest working player on the team. Mm. <laughs> like that's who he is, like fucking crazy, right? Like, how does that even work? But I like, respect that super much, man. It's like to, same, to, yeah. to, to disagree with the whole process, but still giving it an honest chance because it's the only way to get any empirical evidence <laughs> how many times have i convinced a player to try a champion and he's not bought in and he's gonna fucking run it down borderline intentionally and uh, then just blow it off because he thinks that is evidence to his predetermined claim <laughs> i've had many moments of that <laughs> so hey, man, that, I've I've been on both sides of that too, so I get it. <laughs> no, I, I respect that super, super much. It it seemed it seemed like the whole journey of 2020, it seemed like you guys were just very effective individuals. Yeah. We 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 knew how we knew what it took to get the job done. Because it's like I had all the stories from, from 2020 Fanatic, those are those are some wild ones. But when it came to, to playing <laughs> No one knows Everyone seemed to be like sharp, you know, like people oh, yeah. were effective. I remember you guys were pushing crazy solo queue numbers in, 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 in was it in, 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 in Chinese solo queue? Was this, was this when yeah, you were Shanghai, doing your, yeah. your, your, your Renekton tier and, uh, you were, you were, yeah, 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 I was, I, I don't know. Apparently the guy, I knew I played him a lot in solo queue and scrims, but I didn't know I had a reputation for that. <laughs> you told me about this. I didn't know yeah, I had a yeah, reputation. Yeah, bro, this is a Bipo Renekton. It had the fucking reputation. <laughs> I didn't know. I never played it on stage. I, uh, yeah, that's what's like, surprising I that. to me, bro. I remember like live viewing it. I was like, yo, fucking where is Bipo Renekton? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I'm surprised. I Aatrox in 2018, Renekton in 2020. I'm surprised. I'm surprised they never saw the light of day. But uh, they didn't, and that's fine. You know, it is what it is. Mm. But um, it's also because of me, because I also like I, you know, I, I probably had like my own opinions and stuff on it. But I think um, you bring up a good point. I think when it, when when push came to shove th that year, we played. You know, like no personal issues aside, we came to play. Yep, yep. And um, that is something that I really respect all the players that I played with that year for. Is is all personal issues were set aside when when we were on the rift. Um, we all just played the fucking game, and um, we tried our absolute hardest that year. Uh, and I think even though we had some of the most like like I remember like we were barely in playoffs. I think one of those splits, if not both of those splits, it was it was summer split. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure we were like one game up. Like we like fluked into playoffs. Hmm. I'm pretty sure we fluked into playoffs, unironically. Was it the um, eight and ten? Or was it or, or yes? Nine, I think nine. it was an eight and ten split. I have to double check. I, you know what? I'm gonna go check right now. Maybe Maybe it was nine nine. I think it was like the Graves, eight. the Graves, uh, Soraka. Soraka, <laughs> yeah, that was the fucking shit. Yeah, nine nine. We fucking fluked into playoffs. We were one game <laughs> off not making it or some shit, you know, like. And then obviously we we end the split uh, second place, right? Hmm. Um. Actually, did we end? Yeah, we ended second, right? I'm pretty sure we ended second. I believe so. Yeah, you guys found your new stride in playoffs, no? With the Lucian and the Hecarim and the Evelyn. Yeah, Lucian, Hecarim, Evelyn. I remember I I had conversations sitting in front of uh, Reckless's hotel. I was sitting down with him, talking about th talking about him, talking with him about this, like what we needed to do. And uh, I think we we came to we came to conclusions. I think the most powerful thing about that series for me was that we came to conclusions. Without the person in the room, <laughs> we found solutions for people without including them in the discussion. That to me, power like powerful stuff, you know. Like we knew what they needed without actually having to talk to them about what they needed. Powerful stuff, really. Um, I was impressed, you know. Like I, I, 
especially now. Like back then, it was just a natural thing, but uh, I don't know how we managed to do it. I, I never recreated that quite the same. Same in like 2021 spring, right? I tried to recreate that, I just could not. I, 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 I related it a little bit to 2021 uh, summer. Summer, I agree. Summer, we did a good job of that. Finding solutions for the people that weren't in the room. It was like, um, it's like, if when 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 there's the majority of the team bought into something, you can you can pull people along whether they want to or not. <laughs> in my experience, yeah, yeah for sure. Because it was a similar at times in Vitality too. It's a, it was like me, Jizuke, Kawo. Uh, we had a, like a very clear idea of what we wanted to do, and we would if 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 sometimes people were being disagreeable, it, it could be like we we could we could figure out ways to incorporate people, you know. Mm -hmm. It would be like worth to sit down. It's like, oh, how do we work around this, you know, and and make sure mm -hmm. that everyone finds the best self in in in, in this context. The the, the twenty twenty fanatic seems so relatable to our twenty twenty two fanatic. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I, it makes sense. We're like the 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 seeds of of, of pain and disdain. They are so deeply rooted into people that. Uh, Trying to solve them would take a decade, you know, a buildup of uh, of inflammation that uh, it's, it, it's, it's it's better rough. sweeping under the rug, you know. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> but, much, but I think it 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 comes down to the the same conversation always. It's like day one, you 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 gotta agree on things and commit to them. And I fundamentally agree with this. In yeah. I, I don't know how it worked. I don't know, like, I don't know, like, to this day, I, I don't know how exactly it happened, like, how Reckless Hilly survived for three years. Because it, this was not a natural thing. I think this, this, their relationship was not good. Let's, let's put it that way. Mm. Their relationship was not what it's supposed to be, you know? Like, I, I think that, let's put it this way, and uh, I think top support talked more in Fnatic 20, 2018, 2019, 2020, top jungle, top support, sorry, talked more to each other about gameplay and like what we needed to do in the game than AD support. <laughs> mm. <laughs> a bit crazy, you know, if you think about it, like, I feel like <laughs> that, that's like, there, I don't think there's ever been like, I mean, maybe ever, sure, but like, I think it's crazy that like, in terms of gameplay discussion, I don't think I ever really heard Hilly and, and Reckless discussing like, what needed to be done in the game. Like, it was a rare thing, you know, like something that would happen, it's a, like, once in a blue moon, you know? So They, they just, just sat down, and they fucking played, and they were that good that it just worked. So they were just kind of live and let live type of thing. Yep. It's like, you are flawed, I am not going to try to fix those flaws, and I will hope and pray that your way and what you do is the right way. Pretty much. Just react to what the guy does in game, and if it's good, it's good, and if it's bad, it's bad. You know, like, you'd react based, not based on trust, but based on what you're seeing on your screen. And sometimes... Really impressive. Really impressive to me that they managed to make that work as well as they did. Yeah. It is it's such a juxtaposition later, because Hilly, when he worked with Upset, it seemed like he... He had pent up, not talking about bot lane. <laughs> definitely, yeah, definitely. definitely for for yeah. many years. Because... Uh, Upset and, and Hilly, I think they, they achieved new highs because of the effort they put into every single detail. Hilly cared oh, so no, much like... about every detail and uh, Elias had the, the patience to, to listen to him and to, to appreciate him for it. <laughs> 100%. I think it's one of the reasons why I worked as well with him as I did. Uh, same reason. is because I, I would just sit and listen, you know? I, I was... I was just there to to be the damage to the to the CC, you know. Like I, if he said this is winnable, if you do this and this, I would I would just do it. Mm. And uh, I I would always challenge him, but I would never not try what he suggested, you know. I saw what he wanted to do. Uh, if if there's any player that deserves the benefit of the doubt, it's fucking Ellie. There's been moments when, where when I'm it comes like... to fighting champions, I think there is uh, there is no doubt in my experience as well. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, on range champs, when they are flashes on Lulu sometimes, or flanks yeah, with Soraka no. on, on Maybe stage, not. there's definitely been, been some moments, but I, I I think within reason, of course, there's, if, 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 if you, I think, 
it's it's so rewarding to know Hilly if you are willing to just listen. And I think the same thing applies applies to you too. I think I think the majority of of, of our year when when we were working together, I just I just took my time to to, to listen. And uh, at some point, I knew from the back of your neck what you were thinking, <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was always worth it. Yeah, always worth it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think like, the more like I, I have this. I, I talked about this on my stream yesterday, but I have this moment every every so often where I'm just like, I don't know if I should jungle. You know, like I don't know if it'll be that good. You know, like, I don't know. And then I watch a, a competitive best of five, and I'm like, you know what? I'd be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think like I I. I credit my performance in jungle mostly to the fact that I created um, stability in the game, and I, I was very the, the responsibilities people had were very defined. Um, I, I I prided myself on that, and I always like think that like oh you know individually I may not have been that good you know maybe that's why I was so good is because I was just more efficient because I I had a very clear rule set of what I wanted people to believe. I but I think I'm selling myself a little bit short when it comes to playing the role it's, itself as well. I, I think what I, I think f from what you said before, right? I think that you you coming into jungle it it really broke what what the norm was uh, in 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 um, in summer because I think that um, when 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 most junglers or in any role for that matter they get to like play against the same players over and over again, there is certain things that become taken for granted. And I think that mm -hmm. your approach to how you play top lane and also how you approach jungle, you rather than seeing for seeing jungle for what it was for other players, you saw it for what you believed what it be it should be. And I think through that you found so many opportunities that that other players would miss, because if, if, even even something so so simple, which which I think even for I I think for the average viewer they would imagine that junglers sit down and actually do this, but you of course um, I am uh, uh, blanking on his name, but Mr. Speed Clear Demon, Philaris, Philaris, the goat. Philaris, it's like you sat down and, and, and you requested information where I think the process of what how most players learn something is like, oh, I just watched this other pro player do this invade, I'm going to replicate it, rather than finding it the other way around. You know? And I think that you you found ways to really, really squeeze uh, squeeze those opportunities through that information. I think that was a layer of it. I think your understanding of lanes was something that you leveraged super, super well because I think inherently jungling is just the decision between farming or or, or contesting. And I think that you are insanely accurate in, in, in choosing the moments to do so. I think also in regards to our bot lane, they always set up cases where it would be worth for that to happen. I remember sure, there are yeah. many discussions where, you know, a lot of games were pretty much like blue gromp into uh, uh, wolves, and if you're quick enough, you did raptors too into cross into enemy blue and uh, and contest with with the slow push on bot. Like that was a cookie cutter thing that we did, and we we sat down and mm -hmm. did it. And I think that also, like in in that discussion of knowing when you should be pressuring, you also knew when you had to to carry the game. Uh, like I remember many games where you say, "Yo." This game, I need to get to Divine Sunderer, and then I'm going to carry the game. Uh, I remember many, many games, and those are having that level of, of of thinking in terms of how your decision, how your decision tree pans out. I think that you had the most amount of flexibility to that because I think that you defined the role through what you believed the role should be, rather than what the role was at the time in Europe. And I think this made you, honestly, I believe that you were the best jungler in summer. In, in 2021. I appreciate that. I think that... I, I, think, I think I was the best at many things. And I think... Um, that is why I think, like, at the end of the day, I have quite an ego about it. Because, like, like I said, like, like you're mentioning, I think a lot of things that people don't do, 
are like necessities. Like they should be basic. You know, like I think so many times when I see junglers having flash and they are not proactively looking to punish the enemy like the enemy laner that burned their flash and died one v one. You know, that to me is like I don't know how that is possible when when obviously granted that they're playing an early game champion that wants to get shit done, you know? Like I don't know how Lee Sin with Flash can let someone that burned Flash at level two like level two bot lane, like how did it, how does this guy not die, right? Like how is that possible? There must be a timing in five minutes of laning where he's either going to lose a shit ton of CS, lose plates, or die. Just something, you know? Like there, like the squeeze should be a natural thing, and I feel like it, 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 to this day, I watch so many games where we are not coordinating this and we are not practicing this, and I think that is also a big thing, of, a big reason for why I was successful in the jungle. Because, uh, like I mentioned at the very start of the, our conversation, is like the the way one practices in scrims is so important, and I think I did a very good job of explaining people what I wanted to get out of my clear. Yes, you know, yes. like I want to get this out of my clear. I want to be able to recreate this. This is what this clear is for, mm. right? Like I I'm I'm doing this camp into this camp into this camp because I can do this. And I can interact with your lane. And if you want, like, if, we, if we sync this well together, then I think you can manage the waves in this way to really squeeze, you know, and then we can both profit big time and we can make the games very difficult to play to a point where people started banning Thresh of Helios, right? Yes, yes. Um, because we would constantly play Thresh of Helios. Uh, Vigo was what I played with it the most because it was just the best meta champion and also what suited me the best, I think, in terms of like flexibility as a champion. Mm. Uh, other than Trundle, which, you know, Trundle is a different phenomenon altogether. But, uh, I think that is like I think that is the number one reason why I think I I, I stood out um, and, and and I think people saw that you know I think people saw that I think a lot of people a lot of fans like they saw me jungle and thought to themselves like this is just natural for him and I think it was as natural as it was because of those practice habits because when we sat down in scrims it was about the best decisions uh, it was about like the best practice you know and it wasn't it wasn't just about like the big moments on stage it wasn't about like 1v9ing or my bottling carrying or me carrying or adam carrying or, or niski carrying it wasn't about that it was about when we scrimmed i had a clear prepared for a specific reason either to get me ahead to get bot lane ahead to get mid ahead to get top ahead whatever it was and i would fully commit to that hmm. And I would f make people buy into that clear and, 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 and buy into the timings that I had when I did that clear. It's like, this is when you're supposed to be fighting him because here I'm available and here I'm not. So make sure that you don't need me because if you need me here, then there's no point in me doing this clear and I should do a different one, right? And, yes, and yes. I think that structure is, is really what elevated us. And um, uh, the fact that we connected. When I rewatch the games from that split, the number one thing I see in our team is that all five players are on the same screen when we are making a play. Yeah, yeah. One of the and I sense. attribute that to working with you and then Hilly, of course. And I think that you, Hilly, uh, did a fantastic job at making this a, a real thing. Is, is, is that connection, uh, like, you know, connecting together as a team. For sure. That was powerful. That was powerful. I think it's very like honestly, if you like, if you pull up any of those, especially in the in the, in the playoffs, like you, when we when we won the game. There was five people. Like there was five fanatic players on that yes, same yes. screen. No, it was it was like uh, the, the, those games. They are so vivid memories. Like uh, like all the TF games. It's like oh, we have rapid fire. Let's fucking go. <laughs> but yeah, the yeah. Trundle pillars. I see everyone hitting with five men on it, and it's it's it, the the memories are 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 very very vivid. I think. I think it's 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 weird because I think that's common in every role, but I think when a lot of players they play through familiarity rather than a critical decision making based off of the variables presented to them, and I think when to to, to get the most out of jungle, I think that just because of how dynamic it can be in comparison to lane phases that should be rather structured in most cases, right? If, if a good player plays against a good player, then it's like a lot of those matchups should be almost predetermined, right? While jungle has, sure, in some cases, everything can be predetermined too, because if, if, if it's implied that the lanes play appropriately, but there's a lot of cases where they don't, right? And that's where mm -hmm. the decision tree begins to branch out. And I think... A lot of players play with that level of familiarity because they take their ideas from from higher places 
they make it their own rather than finding the way to create that idea on their own through uh, critically combing through what the opportunities are within a game. And then additionally, I think I've never had a better run of scrims than we've had when we were at uh, the, well, well, yeah, when we were, when we were at the World Championship uh, at 2021 in Iceland, right? And I think inherently what, what, what made you such a great jungler was because I think that you take whatever responsibility you have insanely serious. And I think jungler, the jungler in scrims has the biggest responsibility. I think that sometimes mm -hmm. you can get away with inting your lane a little bit. Maybe you give a kill or give a kill or die or two. But if a jungler makes a mistake, the game just fucking ends in a lot of cases very, very fast. It's like you, you, you mm -hmm. make a mistake, you die, you go for crab when you shouldn't, you die, you do something stupid, invite timing is bad. All of a sudden that the game falls apart because your options are just completely diminished, right? And I think mm -hmm. you are a person that really takes the responsibility insanely serious. And I think that's what made us insanely sharp in, in 2021, because you took your responsibility serious, that made the practice good. And uh, through that, we actually became uh, like a pretty strong team on, up until the point where we, we fought against Mad Lions, because I think the way they they just understood macro in terms of how they, they, they moved on the map, it just made us like run after them most of the time. Mm -hmm. They were very good at buying time against us up until the point where they could be winning. Yeah, I agree. They were a strong team. For sure. Boop. We have now talked for 2 hours and 20 minutes. And I wanted to ask you, uh, before LCS starts, I wanted to ask you, because I'm, uh, I'm curious, I don't know how much you can say, but I know there was a rumbling of, uh, you know, uh, Team Eretics Bwipo with Nemesis. That mm -hmm. made me very, very excited. Was that was that a real thing, or maybe you can't it say? It was a real thing. It was it a was real, real thing? Shit. I can say that it was a real thing. I cannot say why it didn't go through. Okay. Um, all that I will say is... I was heavily considering it, and I think so was Nemesis, and eventually we, you know... Uh, it didn't happen, but it was a real thing, and I, 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 was, I, I bought into it. Mm -hmm. I, I was willing to move for that opportunity. Uh, it, it was not like I, I, I left it up to someone else to make that decision and uh, I respected their respected the, their point of view like I, I think you know I don't want to say uh, too much because obviously like why is, is none of anyone's business but yeah, yeah. I think if Nemesis had decided to join that team I would have to okay why he didn't is a different topic but I, I, I needed him to be there to feel good about it because I think a lot of people, what they don't understand is I have a life here. I bought into li the living in, in LA, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I, I fully committed. And moving, because at this point I have like a family, you know, I have pets, I have my, 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 my partner, I have, you know, like I have a life, you know, like yes, it's yes. not just me. And, and the stress of, of making that move comfortable for, for, for everyone involved, my pets, her, like basically my whole family, you know, like it's th th this is my family, you know, like this is m my, my, my life. Um, I was worried that the stress of that would outweigh the positives of, of, of making a roster move um, and playing an LEC. And I was worried that in such a short split of nine games, right, because realistically you get nine games to prove yourself yes, and yes. make it to the playoff bracket, that the stress of this move would affect my performance in the short term and that I would not be able to make it to the playoffs comfortably. And then because I'm not in the playoffs comfortably, I'm constantly stressed about making it to playoffs. And then that will affect my actual playoffs performance. And it snowballs, right? I, I do think stress snowballs very quickly. Yes, yes. Uh, into like a very big problem uh, if you are not careful. So, um, you know, being perfectly honest with you, this is why I was hesitant about it. Uh, however, I put myself in a position where I said, you know what, like I... I believe that if I if I if Nemesis is joining me, that it will be worth the risk. Mm. Um, it fell through, and in the end, uh, you know, it was decided that this was not it, and uh, I respect his decision for that. You know, I, I I completely respect it. I think that people underestimate how uh, like big of a change it would be, and you know. I didn't ask why or whatever, like, uh, you know, we were talking about it, but uh, at the end of the day, it didn't matter. And, like, 
I respect him enough to, that when he said that like he he did not think it was. I mean, I don't know if I should even say this uh, like publicly because I don't want to put make this a thing. It's just like for me personally, I don't also put, I don't also want people to think that I decided not to do it. Uh, it's just like I just felt like if if it was not him, it was not worth the risk because of this for me personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't want people to you know think that like he decided against it. Like he has his own good reasons. I I imagine and. Uh, I respect those. Okay. Okay. No, I, I, I think it's, it's important that if someone makes such a big move, right? It's, it's, it's a very, very big move because so many moving parts that already if someone like whoever that is says, yo, I, I am not interested to do this. I think that's already like you, you, you have um, a, enough trust to, to, to know that if the buy-in is not there completely, that it's not the right move to do. So it makes sense. Yeah. Like it's, it's like, I mean, it's just like, it's not only just that, you know, it's like, I respect him as a friend and I want the best for him too. And if he doesn't believe that this is what's best for him, it's like, it's, it's really simple, you know, like then, then I will never put him in a position where he has to do that. I, I think it was a, an opportunity, but at the end of the day, also uh, talking to heretics is like, they were telling me that they were happy with Evie. So like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to like, if a team does not truly see, like, I was in a position you know where it's like, worth, team, you know what you're worth. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, look, if you're happy with him, then, you know, like, why like, you're talking to me for, like, what, you know, like, like just because, like, the, the both of us would be a great deal. And then if, if one of the two does not add up, then at the end of the day, like, if you only see me as an upgrade with him or like a real, like a huge upgrade with him, but you see me as a side grade when I, when I'm not in, like, when it's not me plus him, I, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Am I that excited to join your team? You know, like, yeah, yeah, not like particularly, a, right? D dance with me a little bit, you know, make me feel good, you know? I, I, I think that... Uh, talking to Excel, they made me feel that way, actually. Um, but I came to the conclusion that, um, same idea, right, with the move and the stress there, um, I, I came to the conclusion that it was not worth the risk. Hmm. Because um, they had the same, they had the exact same roster, and I thought like they were keeping the same roster, same staff, same everything, and I thought that a one-player change would not be sufficient okay. um, to to you know warrant taking that risk. Uh, however, they managed to make it work, and I'm very happy for them. Yep, yep. Um, you know, because uh, I think they 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 you know like. In, at least in the conversations I had with them, they were very, very kind to me, and 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 they made me feel like what I was saying was valuable to them. Oh, it's 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 very important. I I, I think it's 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 like I know for the most most part, people just say that it's 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 business and so forth. But I think uh, investing time into into courtesies and investing effort and even money into into courtesies it really 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 creates a reputation and that reputation really, really travels far i think mm -hmm. you know it's like uh, you can draw an example of uh like when we went to the gucci store right it's like the gucci store it's like it's clothes it's clothes it's clothes but there is a certain feeling that you have when you enter the store <laughs> <laughs> that, oh no, for sure, that, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's what that's what <laughs> what the price tags are for. <laughs> yeah, the VIP, you know, like you're a VIP, you are valued, you know. I I think yes, yes. being valued is is it, it is a feeling that is hard to replicate uh, without sincerity. Yes, yes. And uh, I value that, you know, everyone does. Uh, talking about the, I just wanted to change the the, the topic here mm. because obviously we're running a bit out of time. Um, just talking about players, the, you you mentioned that you wanted to work with some players. I would love to work with Bo. Bo. Um, okay. I had an opportunity to, and uh, at the end, I I did not let, I did not honor my verbal agreement. So I I am I am I am of course you know I I, I do think that the like I, I'm not gonna lie about it right like I I I regret that mm. because I agreed to something that I had not truly thought out. Yes. Yes. Uh, however, it, it is a damn shame to me to see that this player is not successful. It's you know? crazy. Because there is no way you can look at the you, there's no way you can look at this guy play and think to yourself that he's not good. Yes, yes. That 
that is not possible, I think. I think this guy is fucking good. <laughs> I was addicted. Addicted to watching every fucking Soluki game of his, every CQ game. He's charming, funny. He plays so damn good. It's it's truly a mystery how fall uh, like the fall has been like this. And he's in a weird position, I, right? Very weird position. Because yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, that's why I mentioned that I broke verbal, right? Because at the end of the day, it, like I, I, I would be open to to listening to if he's still on vitality to definitely open opening up a discussion with them about what they want to do. Because uh, you know, whilst I said no, that was a circumstantial no. That was not a no because I don't want to do it. You know, like that was yes, like, yes. I, at the end of the day. Like I just didn't. I I hadn't considered all the variables from my perspective, and and, and also like I I I, I needed a break. Mm. I, I really did. You know, I, I I took a break and I do not regret it. I feel like I am revitalized and I am ready and better than ever and in terms of the state of mind, at least. Of course, my mechanics will need some, some working on, which is why I'm going to Korea and honing myself. Mm. Um, but uh, in terms of, like, mindset, I think I I don't think I've ever been more ready to win a championship, you know, and, and, and lead a team because... Uh, I've been working with um, my therapist in, in LA here, and um, he really is more of a mentor than a therapist only, to be fair with you. Mm. My good friend Bowen, uh, he, um, he has taught me much about leadership as well, and I really, I think I've elevated myself in so many aspects, in, in terms of life, in terms of perspective, professional, personal, everything. And I don't know, I feel like I'm a different person. I really feel like these, these two years here, like they have changed me. I am no longer the same person I used to be. Hmm. I mentioned before that I could uh, read what you're thinking based off of your neck. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I can say, you know, it's like, even though, you know, the times we talk, it's, it's fairly limited in the year. I think in the context of esports, we, we still stay in touch pretty damn well. <laughs> I agree, yeah, I agree. And I, I also, I, 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 I get this feeling that it's like, I've I've I followed your level of maturity and how much you've grown as as a person because it's like when when we've worked together for a year it's like I I am now so invested in 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 who you are going to become and who you are you know <laughs> and I, I I can definitely from from the limited time that we talk together I can get that feeling that you are the people that I know but that you are maturing you know and you are growing as a person and that to me it it it, it fills my heart with warmth really i i i am very very happy that you're on a, the right journey for yourself you know thank you i appreciate that i i i'm ready to get off my mountain and uh, come back <laughs> uh, i'm more than open to playing in europe again i i at this point you know it's also like i, I feel like i've overstayed my welcome right it's like I, I've been here for a year. I was pretty much a free agent. If anyone wanted to hire me, they could have. And uh, they decided not to, right? So at that point, it's like, well, if, if, I, if I'm not wanted, if I'm not a priority for, for any of these teams, then uh, at the end of the day, it is time to go to a place where I am, right? Do, do you see yourself playing any other role than, than, than jungle and top? Do you, mm, do you... I don't think there is a need to. I think I, I would like, I think the that would have to be something that someone like other people would want me to do. I think, okay. uh, you know, like if for whatever reason, uh, what the Hilly wants to reunite with me in the bot lane, I would be open to that, of course. Yes. Yes. But I think when it comes to mid lane, uh, I, I think I do not need to, you know, like in, in, I, I reached many conclusions in the past where I think I needed to, um, I needed to play another role to have more influence, but uh, what I've come to realize is, is through, uh, proper leadership one can get people to do what they need to do. Mm. You know, I can get people to buy in what I want them to do. Were I to be a, a mid laner, were I to be a jungler, this is what I would want. And this is what the expectations I would set. And I think that, um, that it's, is what I value, you know, like that is in itself, that experience that I gained and, and the know-how of how to apply those leadership skills to get that result is something that I really, really want look forward to using. Uh, because I do want to be on a team that that values me, and I do want to be on a team that that, that at least can align with me on what we see together. You know, uh, because subconsciously I used a lot of leadership skills, but now that I am conscious of them, I can uh, I can, you know, 
practice the cause and effect, right? Yes, yes. I can, I, I can make it so because it is, I'm, I want it to be, not because it is an, an accident, because I think that is something that I, I, I noticed in my career. It's like a lot of things went right by accident, not by design. Mm. That is a, a very lucky thing for me. You know, it's like luck is when preparation meets opportunity, but in my case, sometimes I just got lucky in the sense of like, I wasn't prepared. I just, I, I found the right answers, you know? Yes, yes. They just came to me and they didn't, they weren't prepared. It just, it just made sense, right? I, I think that's a, a fine way to put it. So I, um, I'm quite... I'm quite fortunate in life. That's also what I realized. Uh, very, very fortunate. Very, very grateful for, for the opportunities I've gotten, for the people I've met. And, you know, I, I'm i in a good place uh, in all ways, shapes, and form. I'm glad. We're... That said, who, 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 who I'm going to be working with next year, I don't know. And the beauty of, the beauty of having waited this year and, and, and having waited it out was also, and this is something that I definitely considered uh, throughout that period, is, is now I have the, the freedom. You know, there is nothing that ties me after this year. There is no, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm as fresh as, as it can be, you know, like I am a completely free agent. There is no buyout. There is no like bias towards who I worked with last year. Nothing. I am completely free to judge people based on their gameplay and what I think is good League of Legends. And I think actually when you're in the sauce, it can be very easy uh, in my experience to like overvalue or undervalue certain traits. Uh, to give you an example, I, I, we, we played against EG in my last best of five, and we played against uh, EG, and, and then Blind picked Gangplank Victor, and I picked Orn into that. And I like in the, at the moment, it was the most natural thing in the world to do. I, I didn't even think about them. Like I thought about an alternative, but it didn't cross my mind that this was ridiculous. Mm. Uh, right now, I, I, you couldn't, you couldn't, you, you, you'd have to f find me a million dollars to make me do that again. <laughs> Literally, like you'd have to fucking, you'd have to fucking rip my my mouse out of my hand to walk in Orn again there. Like I would, I would, I would fucking, I would get off stage and walk off if someone made me do that. Like that was disgusting. Like disrespecting me like that, blinding that champion in that spot. Like there's, I would not allow it for a second. But I was just so it's such a mindset that I needed to do and conform to what like everyone else expected of me that I lost track of what needed to be done. And that, that is a value that I have gained, uh, you know, from this break. You know, like when I watch players play, when I watch, I don't, I'm not biased. I'm not biased towards what I would do in a pro game. I purely see, like not purely, I guess. I'm still a little bit biased. I'm just not biased as like a pro player as like, ah, oh, I get why he did that. You know, like it yeah, makes yeah. sense. It's just more like, no, he should be better than that. And I should strive to be better than that. I, I shouldn't make those excuses because, you know, at the end of the day, as a, as a, performer, as a performer, one cannot use stress as an excuse, right? Uh, until, until the season is over, one cannot use that as an excuse, in my opinion. Like, you can't say, like, I didn't perform because of stress. Like, that is just not, a, that is not something that you can do, in my opinion. That's Everyone is job, under right? stress. That's, that's the job. I exactly. It, it's, it's like... Um... The, the management of, of, of all of these variables. It's like everyone lives a very complex life. And uh, I, I, I feel like in, in, in a lot of cases, it's like, especially in league, right? So you only have five players. It's like five mm -hmm. players that have their own lives. Like if someone goes through hardships, that is going to uh, affect the team. It's like you, you don't. It's like substitutions is not a thing. <laughs> and, it should be, but it is not. Yeah, I agree. Uh... It's like I just, uh, what Fab said always, so the, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, no, no, go ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted to say, just to clarify, you know, like stress cannot be an excuse because everyone has it. Not because it is not a good excuse, but everyone is under stress. So if you make stress an excuse for you, you have already lost before you started because everyone is sharing that stress and you are not alone. Like, the, enemy, the enemy players you're playing against are under stress. Your teammates are under stress. Everyone you work with is dealing with stress, and, and, and in a competition like uh, like league, especially, it's, it is just something that one has to uh, live up to. What did you want to say about Fab? I miss Fab. No, he, he always said. He, Fab always said, "It's like you have to practice resilience because you don't know what the fuck situations you're gonna be facing. Have to practice resilience. The best teams and the best players, they don't. They they wake up. Maybe they have they lost." 
Maybe they wake up and all of a sudden they don't have a leg or some fucked up shit happen, whatever the fuck, they fucking perform, you know? It's like, you, you, there's too many things that you don't have control over that you don't have room to be fragile because it's like you move to a world championship and you're going to get, you're going to have shit PCs, you're going to have fucking, you're going to have COVID tests that are insanely invasive, you're going to be going through whatever the fuck, you know? Shit can happen. <laughs> The fucking, ooh, I feel him up here. Yeah, bro. That that the stories of that is is fucking mental. The, the, but... the twenty twenty worlds, holy fuck, man! That that airport COVID test, like I swear to God, like it literally, like it was unbelievable. Like I don't think like, I didn't know it was legal to get violated like that. Uh, it's it's. I remember when <laughs> I uh, that same year I I worked in Korea, right? When I oh, arrived, my Lord. I, when I arrived. It's like they stuck in that fucking thing and they, they kept it in there for two minutes. Yep. And the, the person who did it, he did, he like, he like sh shoved it in really, really deep. Right. And then he did, he just showed his, he, he let go of it. He just had his hands. He just showed his hands. Oh he did like God. no hand sign. I was like, bro, are you, are you, are you enjoying yourself when you're doing this shit? Showing me no hands. <laughs> and then every now and Crazy. then he just did a little spin, you know, I was like, Jesus. I was like, the spin like, is what got me. Like the, the tears in my is... eyes, like, oh my god. <laughs> the spin is crazy. I didn't know the nose canals were built like that, you know, like fucking pulling out fucking chunks of my brain. Uh, that's that shit is crazy. So whip, I hope that in some shape or form our our paths across again. I hope uh sincerely I hope that I get to see you play in, in the next year. I think that uh the, the league sincerely misses you. I think that you've always been a very, very positive force uh, at your best. And uh, even at your worst, you are fucking a big benefit to the league, you know? And I'm so excited. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, again, I'm not promising I'll come back to Europe just yet, right? If there's a great no, opportunity course, here, I will consider it, no doubt. But um, I just want to make it very clear that I am, I am willing and I'm listening to... To any and all European offers, and honestly, all offers really. Like I, I, like I said, you know, like being a coach, it's not something that I'm against. I, I think I can do a lot for player development, and um, I think I have the capability to wrestle with players and really teach them left from right. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. You would have like, my utmost difference. recommendation if uh, <laughs> anyone came to me to ask. Utmost. I appreciate that. It's just, you know, like I think th there are too few coaches that can sit down with their players and make them, um, you know, make them, I guess, submit, you know, like really just get them to understand like this is this is what you're here for, you know, like th this sequence, this, this consistency that you are bringing to the scrims, this is why you're scrimming. You're not scrimming to show me that you can carry a game. I wouldn't have hired you if I thought you couldn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, a lot of people don't get that, you know? Like, I wouldn't have hired you if you couldn't carry a game, bro. You wouldn't be getting paid to play League if you couldn't. That's not why you're scrimming. You are scrimming here to show me that you are able to set aside your urge to carry the game and elevate another player on your team. And then when it is your turn to take that responsibility and truly carry the game. Not everyone can be Michael Jordan all the time. I don't think... Amen. It's... All Amen. It, all it comes down to. Define everything from the get-go. Get the buy-in from everybody. Figure out everything that you need to figure out and can figure out before you scrim because in scrims you need to perform. And when you perform, you can grow together and not waste everyone's fucking time because you need to figure out the matchup or why a champion is shit yep. or not shit. And we could have figured that out ahead of time. And yep. then you could win a championship. So, ladies and gentlemen... You better fucking hire Whip. I feel okay. like next year could be a great year for Europe again because I feel like there's a lot of free agents that uh, are lurking, you know, like lurking. And I feel like a, a big thing, I think a big thing in terms of how the, like the West need outliers in order to compete. It's like then you need, you need, you need a freak accident to happen. Like a lot of things need to, like stars need to align for, 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 for the West to compete at, at, at a higher level. And, um, uh, I think it starts in putting together the right rosters, you know, because 2018, 2019, G2 and Fnatic put together really fucking solid rosters. And I'm excited to know that some of those players are looking to get back into the fucking mix uh, once again.
A special thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Use the link below to claim your bonuses now. Play War Thunder. So, Whip, any final words? No, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. And uh, in general, you know, uh, a reminder to all people that your favorite players are human. Mm. I think they try their hardest. I, I don't know, I've never met a single player that didn't try their best. Um, well, I, that's not true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough, that's not true. But, uh, you know, like I, I haven't met a player that uh, didn't take it seriously. Let's put mm. it that way. That's for sure. I think there was more left in the tank for some people I've worked with, but uh, certainly they took it seriously. That I can say for a fact. There is no one that does not have uh, the best intentions of the people. Like I, I haven't worked with a person that did not have the best intentions for their people on the team and obviously themselves as well. Uh, I've never had like a you know a kamikaze artist. <laughs> no sense. <laughs> uh, never that. So. No, I I I concur with that. I've I've maybe worked with maybe 200, 300 different individuals on teams. I can remember two specific ones, and they are like really, yeah, <laughs> stories <laughs> for a autobiography in fifty years. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> not legal, not legal to be released right now. Yes, yes, the the, the statute of limitation is fifty years <laughs> on those stories. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So um, other than that, yeah, just. You know, I appreciate that. Like, I, I, you don't get a chance to say it very often, but uh, it, it is it's important, in my opinion, to appreciate uh, esports for what it is. You know, it is it is young people because I still think most of us are pretty young mm. um, playing a game they are passionate about for a living. And a uh, few times, I can show appreciation for that fact. You know, it's why I will never, I will never not. Like, I will never not take a picture with a fan. I will never not interact with fans when possible. Like, obviously, not to a point where it's, like, uh, unfair, right? Where it's, like, I, I give one person more attention than the other. And, like, it's, just like, there is, you know, there is a balance there. Because all fans for me are equal, right? And, mm. Except the ones that send me death threats and shit. And, <laughs> like, those people, yeah, not okay. But um, <laughs> the ones that are sincere and, and, and watch because of, you know, they enjoy it. Mm. Uh, I can only share my appreciation for those people because at the end of the day, uh, you are the reason I get to do what I want to do. Uh, you are, I am able to do what I'm passionate about in life, thanks to you. So, um, shout out to those people. You know, I know a lot of your listeners are people like that. So, uh, if not the majority of, that's why I love your community and uh, I like saying hi and dropping by because. Um, <laughs> There is a lot of love and, and, and a lot of positivity in esports and in gaming in general. And I think that a lot of people recently in times like to focus on the ne negatives of it, but really, it is a beautiful thing. 100%. Uh, the, 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 the whole life we're living with it seems so surreal to me. Like, I agree. Even, I'm it, so grateful. Me too. And it comes back to what you really, really mentioned before. Humility, right? Humidity is, 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 is key. It's like, it's, it's weird when I stream and there's 500 homies watching. That seems so surreal to me because it's... 100%. Maybe half of them are asleep, but even then, it's like a whole cinema is there listening to whatever garbage I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's surreal. Yeah. And that's At any given time of the day, you know, like, it's absolutely insane to me, like, how people with, like, large viewerships they, they 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 think that it is a given you know they think that it is a granted thing that and yeah they'd work for it but that doesn't mean that they you know the thing about esports and being popular is, is, is like a celebrity within esports a celebrity in general it is it, it is it is given mm. it is not earned at the end of the day it is i guess it, it, to an extent it is earned but i don't think it is as much earned as it is given you know i think people are they are giving you this, you know. Uh, that's what I truly think. No, I think whether it is one or the other, it helps to think that it is given. Because sure. inherently, I think that that is what is going to benefit you in the long run to not take anything for granted. I no, think. I agree. Okay, Bob. Always a pleasure, my man. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Maybe we, we catch yeah, each other on I, some I love of the, this. Of the costumes. Maybe we catch each other in Korea too. Are you gonna head up to the Ellis house or what is your plan? So I, I need to double check with him because uh, obviously, like I, I don't want just to be a burden to him. You know? spot, man. Just kick him out. Dude. He's just, <laughs> he's just. Uh, just uh, stealing his dog to hit on ladies, I guess, as the tenacity told me himself. Was, uh, I think it's it's time sure. for him to. to um, I, I, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. I, I, like I said, you know, it's 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 his decision. Obviously, it's his house. I respect that. Mm. It's, people live there by his by his rules, I imagine, and uh, I, I, I adhere to that. You know, when I stay with someone, I, I never want to be a burden. You know, I, 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 I you know, it needs to be comfortable for them, and that's why I'm, I'm very much. Uh, He's he, he it will be up to him, and uh, either way, I'm going to find a way to, to make it work there. Uh, the idea is to, to go there end of August, or end of this month, somewhere like uh, the week of the 24th to 30th is when I will go, and then I will be back in October 25th or so because that's like 10 days into worlds, usually 10 days into worlds after groups ends. Uh, I personally feel like most. Uh, most of the time, that's when, like, also the the hype and the solo queue dies down. Obviously, not the hype for the best of fives, but like that's when like the solo queue yeah, starts. Yeah. People start going home, you know. Of and that's course. when people have, you know, they're off of their, you know, 16 hour a day shift and they, they start calming down and starting to play like 12 hours more so. And just it's, it's more about um, being in the right mental state than it is about the intense practice at that point, I feel. Yes, yes. Uh, that's my experience, at least uh, also in the past, you know, like when I think of the first days of groups and the weeks like leading into the, the world's boot camp, like that's when it's like, holy moly, I'm. I I I don't even like I don't even know what the outside of my hotel looks like, you know, like I, I have no <laughs> idea. No, for uh, sure. But then, um, like maintaining near form, the end right? of it, suddenly it's like, oh, I'm in the city, you know? <laughs> like, oh, I realize, like, oh, I'm in a different city. Mm. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Okay, I'm going to cut it there. Boom. <laughs>